Welcome everyone to today's Public Standards Board meeting for the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. I'm Jeffrey Hales and I am uh, chair of the Standards Board and I've got with me today uh, the team uh, uh, as well as the, the rest of my fellow board members who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, but let me start by uh, just by making a few reminders. One is that uh, uh, today's meeting is uh, public but it's not uh, interactive and so uh, there isn't really going to be an opportunity for us to engage with uh, those who are listening in today, uh, but we do encourage you to submit questions, uh, and you can do that through uh, through the meeting as well as on our webpage, and we will try to, uh, to follow up afterwards. There'll also be uh, uh, an archive of today's session. It is being recorded and will be archived and, and placed on our website. Uh, the website is also where you can find materials for, for today's meeting as well. Uh, and in general, we, of course, invite you to submit uh, uh, any comments and questions uh, to, to us through our, our Contact Us page or through our public comment form. So with that, we'll go to the, the next slide and, uh, and do some introductions. As I mentioned, I'm Jeffrey Hales, uh, a professor at the University of Texas and, and chair of the Standards Board. Uh, and I have with me today the other 10 board members. So we'll, uh, we'll start with uh, Verity Chagar. Verity, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Jeff, and hi, everyone. We have you by audio, but no video today, I understand it, um, unless that changes. So, but welcome, Verity. Uh, that may be true for a number of our board members. We're having a, a bit of a WebEx issue, I think. Um, uh, Bob Hurth, welcome. Yes, good morning, Jeff, and hello, everyone. Thank you, Bob. Good morning. Uh, Kurt Kuhn. I'm here indeed. Excellent. Hi, Kurt. Uh, we hear you well. Uh, Lloyd, Lloyd Kurtz. I'm here. Thanks for being here, Lloyd. You. Good to see you as well. Uh, Dan Geltzer. I, I seem to be having some connection issues too, but I'm here at the moment, so good morning. Hey, wonderful. Thanks for being here, Dan. Uh, Elizabeth Seeger. I'm here. Thanks, Jeff. Welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, Mark Siegel. Hello, everybody. Good to be here. Thanks, Mark. Wonderful to have you. Um, Suzanne Stormer. I'm here too. Uh, pleased to be here. Good afternoon to you, Susanna. Suzanne. Thank you. Um, and uh, Stephanie Tang. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning. Uh, uh, we can see you. Wonderful. And uh, and Mark Fasson. Good afternoon to you. Yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Jeff. I'm I'm here, and uh, uh, maybe you should mention that I uh, unfortunately have to leave a bit early today, but uh, I'm here until well, seven o'clock my time. Okay. Wonderful. We appreciate you making time to be here, Mark. Great. So we can go to the, the next slide. We have, um, uh, oh, I think, do we lose the slide? Yeah, hold on just one second, Jeff. Sorry about that. Uh, we're okay. just having some reports that people can't uh, see the slides, so I'm trying to restart them. Okay. We may be uh, back paid on our, our WebEx subscription, and so they're, they're giving us <laughs> the... All right, looks like we see them. Well, uh, while those are coming up, we have, yeah, there we are. So uh, we've got um, uh, a full agenda for, for today. We'll be uh, starting off as we often do with, uh, with an update and then hitting some of our um, uh, standard setting projects uh, and, and some of the ongoing research that we're doing uh, and then uh, offering some concluding remarks. So on the next slide, we see uh, our, our full agenda, which is gonna be broken into two main sessions. And so this morning, we'll start off with that uh, overview of our, of, uh, what's going on at the Value Reporting Foundation, some recent announcements, which I'm sure uh, most of our, our listeners are, are familiar with, and, uh, and then uh, an update on some of our, our activities that may not be covered uh, as, as comprehensively in today's session. Uh, and, and then we have a number of, of standard setting and research issues that we're gonna be covering today. Uh, one on human capital, uh, looking at a standard setting pro a project proposal for, um, for human capital in, in the SASB standards. Uh, we'll then uh, take a break and then when we come back, we'll be looking at greenhouse gas emissions in the marine transportation um, issue. Oh, Kurt, we do see you now. Uh, looks like your camera came back. Um, and, uh, and then also uh, we've got uh, raw materials um, uh, sourcing an update from our recent public comment period, which closed uh, earlier this, uh, 
this last year. Uh, and then we'll be looking at uh, um, some updates on uh, what we've, uh, some thinking related to technical updates. So uh, with that, that, that is our, our day, um, our, our meeting agenda. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide and uh, put, invite Brian to join me, Brian Esterly, who is uh, the Chief Technical Officer for SASB Standards. So uh, Brian, I know, has been uh, very busy uh, you know, these days with um, many things that are going on uh, at the Value Reporting Foundation and, and with a particular emphasis on the implications for the SASB standard. So, uh, Brian, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Thrilled to be here today with you and the full standards board. I think we've all been very busy um, as of as of late and um, excited to get into maybe a few of the reasons why. Um, so some very big uh, developments uh, related to the Value Reporting Foundation, the SASB standards, and really the sustainability space overall um, since our last public board meeting. Um, I'm going to take just a brief amount of time here to run through a few slides that has uh, uh, touches on these these updates since our last meeting. Um, the standards board is 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 uh, overall up to speed here and aware of of everything that's taken place and often been involved and engaged in these developments. Um, with that said, just given the very high level of significance of these um, these these updates uh, to the to the organization and to the space, we thought it made a bit uh, a sense to spend a bit of time. Uh, running through before we get into the more technical standard setting uh, portion of the meeting where we want to spend the bulk of the, the time uh, today. Um, uh, looking to also make sure that we're, you know, the full standards board is, is on the same page and where we are and what lies ahead in our next steps. I'm also looking for this to be of, of benefit to the observers from the public that have uh, joined us today. Um, and then lastly, I'm hoping to share at least a few high level comments around the um, how these these uh, organizational landscape updates relate to the really the framing and the context for the rest of the meeting today and our more technical standard setting activities. So with that said, why don't we jump right into it and move to the next slide. So last month, as I'm sure, as I know, our full standards board is aware and many folks um, out there in the in the, uh, the the public are well aware. On November 3rd, the IFRS Foundation made two, three very significant announcements. The first and foremost was that they announced that they will in fact establish the International Sustainability Standards Board or the ISSB. Secondly, they announced the consolidation with the Climate Disclosure Standards Board or CDSB, as well as the Value Reporting Foundation or VRF. Uh, in terms of VRF, this includes both the SASB standards, all of our work, as well as the IR framework. Number three, the IFRS Foundation also published the, some of the work of the Technical Readiness Working Group. Uh, this included the publication of two prototype standards, a climate prototype, as well as a general requirements prototype that I'll touch on a bit later here. Let's move to the next slide, please. A little bit on the IFRS Foundation overall for those, um, at least in the public, that may not be quite as familiar. The IFRS Foundation was established about 20 years ago. They're a not-for-profit public interest organization. They are the, 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 a global standard setting body for financial reporting uh, standards or accounting standards. The, the financial reporting standards are required in over 140 different jurisdictions around the world. They have a governance structure that's that's generally quite similar to our governance structure here at the Value Reporting Foundation, where they have the organizational board or trustees, and then they have the independent standard setting board, which up to this day has been the IASB responsible for financial reporting standards. With this announcement, they have now established the, what we see on the bottom right in red there, the ISSB. Also of note is that they have an, an uh, oversight uh, board, the, the uh, monitoring board, really designed to improve public accountability and oversight. So this is a major development for the IFRS Foundation and really the global reporting landscape that they've taken the step to formally announce the establishment of the ISSB. Let's move to the next slide, please. When we come back to the Value Reporting Foundation and look at the consolidation with the IFRS Foundation, this is how we view it right here on this slide, is 
starting with the, the IR framework. The IR framework does not necessarily consolidate just into the IASB nor the ISSB. It's more of the overarching corporate framework, somewhat similar to the management commentary project that has been ongoing at the IASB for a number of years here. Um, so the IR framework best consolidates into the foundation more at the organizational level and really has implications for both the IASB and the ISSB. When we turn to our work here and the SASB standards, the SASB standards integrate much more directly into the work of the ISSB. I might note that this consolidation has been announced, but just to be clear, it has not been completed. We're on a timeline to complete the consolidation by mid next year. Next slide. A few comments on what has led to this announcement last month. Uh, we've spoken in the past before, and there have been many public forums and webinars and events and such that have touched on the Technical Readiness Working Group. In uh, uh, early this year, the IFRS Foundation established the Technical Readiness Working Group, whose members you see here on, on this, sl this slide, um, in order to dive into a lot of the preparatory work, in order to provide technical recommendations and strategic recommendations to both the IFRS Foundation and the ISSB. A lot of this work that the TRWG did was designed to give the ISSB a running start so they can very quickly leverage the existing resources that are often widely used out there in the market, very much including the SASB standards, and move into a running start with their own ISSB standard setting work. Um, so again, there were, um, there were five different uh, organizational members of the TRWG. And then importantly, the consolidation announcement applied to not just the Value Reporting Foundation, but the CDSB. Importantly, the TCFD and WEF were also part of the of TRWG and have signaled very strong statements of support for the ISSB and are continuing to contribute technical resources and recommendations and such to the foundation and the ISSB, again, to enable this running start for the ISSB and very much leveraging resources such as the TCFD recommendations and again, including the SASB standards that I'll touch on a bit more in just a moment. Next slide, please. The third announcement that I had mentioned earlier that took place last month was the release of some of the TRWG's work, including two prototype standards. Um, so first I'll start here, and this is really what I think the best place to start is for anyone looking to get up to speed on where the IFRS Foundation is in this area and the likely direction of the ISSB, at least the direction proposed by the TRWG, including the, the Value Reporting Foundation. Uh, we published a summary of the TRWG's program of work. It include, included context around the TRWG, an overview of our work plan throughout much of this year, how we developed the various deliverables that we produced, uh, expectation setting and views on future due process. We summarized all of the different deliverables that we, um, that we worked through over the last you know, no, number of months here, and then provided some context around implications for preparers. In addition to the summary of, of, of the TRWG's program of work, we also published two prototype standards on the next slide. The first is the Climate Related Disclosures Prototype Standard. Uh, this is a uh, designed to be a climate standard that has two different parts to it. The first part is what we're referring to more as the thematic requirements. The thematic requirements are very largely modeled off of and built off of the TCFD recommendations, really designed to carry the TCFD recommendations more into a, uh, a standards format and really a standard it's, it's itself. And the second part of the recommendations were uh, more in terms of industry specific recommendations. So we included those thematic requirements designed to be broadly applicable to across the market, specifically on climate related issues. And then the second part were more of the industry specific disclosure requirements, 
that were uh, were were uh, uh, aligned with our work here at the 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 the, the SASB and um, built off of the the SASB standards. Um, the second prototype that was released was the general requirements for disclosure of sustainability information. This prototype had a few important pieces to it, including the first requirement that companies must disclose all material sustainability information. So it's really the overarching requirement designed to set the stage for the ISSB's future standard setting work and designed to, to really provide that overarching requirement uh, before the ISSB has developed a full suite of, of standards. Additionally, the general requirements prototype is again uh, modeled after the TCFD recommendations, including the four pillars of governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets, providing some of this overarching guidance for how sustainability disclosures should, uh, what in general is, is required, and how such should be structured. Uh, the general requirements also goes into various other types of, of guidance um, and requirements around reporting, such as reporting boundaries, timing and frequency, reporting channel, and items such as this. For those very familiar with the SASB standards, uh, some of this content is similar to our SASB standards application guidance. I would very much encourage folks to review these prototypes that have been released by the IFRS Foundation and were developed by the TRWG. They're very much designed to give a sense of the direction of travel for the ISSB. They're not specifically meant for consultation or for public comment at that, that point, at this point, uh, but the ISSB is expected to pick these prototypes up and begin advancing them through due process as they deem appropriate. So I think it'd be really wise for, for market participants, both investors and preparers, to start to get up to speed and understand uh, the nature of these recommendations. Next slide, please. Just a little bit more on the TRWG recommendations, and then I'll include a few comments around uh, the SASB standards, really implications around the SASB standards. This slide is more of a visual depiction of some of the information that I touched on in the last slide, and that the general requirements are really this overarching guidance around sustainability disclosures on the bottom left. We have a view that the ISSB should develop thematic requirements. Again, thematic requirements are designed to be broadly applicable across the market and touch on some of the, the very key major pervasive themes in the market, climate being the uh, perfect example and where the ISSB is expected to start. And then when we move to the bottom right box and uh, the, the industry box, the TRWG also had a very strong view that it's really important that the ISSB develop industry disclosure requirements. And so that is most similar, extremely similar, really even modeled after the SASB standards that are of course industry specific. The SASB standards are uh, recommended to be the starting point for the ISSB to really pick up and advance through due process to then have the ISSB eventually have established their own industry disclosure requirements. Again, very much based off of and model off of the SASB standards. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of this work is also uh, built off of and leverages the TCFD recommendations, which includes the four pillars around governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. Next slide, please. So just a little bit more on the SASB standards specifically, because this is why we're all, all here today and what the, this organization has been working on uh, very hard for, for 10 years, years, and we've seen so much growth and mar market adoption and momentum and use around the SASB standards, including the market's engagement in our standard setting process uh, for quite a number of years here. So very importantly, I'll reiterate this point, the SASB standards are, are designed to be the starting point for the ISSB in developing their own industry disclosure requirements. This will give really the 10 years of standard setting work and all the oversight and contributions of the standards board here today uh, really now enable the ISSB to pick up this comprehensive body of work and ideally quickly advance it through due process in order to again establish ISSB industry-based disclosure requirements. I'll just briefly touch on the standards advisory group, a fantastic resource for technical input for the board as well as the technical staff. 
Um, we're working to take a view on how to best transition uh, the, the standards advisory group and what future advisory group structures should look like for the ISSB. So a lot of fantastic individuals and resources to pull from, from the existing standards advisory group. I expect this to be a really active topic in early next year as we look towards the, the planned consolidation by mid-2022. Lastly, around the SASB Standards Investor Advisory Group, another fantastic resource for the organization, including the board and the technical staff around their strategic advice and sometimes technical engagement and input and such. Um, we do expect the Investor Advisory Group to transition over to the IFRS Foundation and the ISSB to continue to provide those the strategic advice that has been so extremely valuable for, um, for this organization and the SASB standards, including a lot of support that is very much driven, uh, driven market uptake, um, company uptake in the use of SASB standards. Next slide, please. If, um, just to be very clear around where we stand right now and what the, this consolidation announcement means um, around uh, uh, where we are with advice to investors and preparers, I think this consolidation announcement just really elevates and really just further recognizes the work um, that has produced the IR framework and the SASB standards in a more significant way than we've ever seen before. And it's just really exciting to see the SASB standards now move into uh, really what, what is designed to be the starting point for the ISSB's uh, industry disclosure standards. The point here is that um, if companies have not implemented the SASB standards, um, then I think, I think this, the sooner the better in order to, to be prepared for what lies ahead. Um, a lot of this context is also touched in in the TRWG recommendations and summary of work that I touched on earlier. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I'd certainly recommend that folks get familiar with the prototypes that were released. Uh, they're an early direction of, of travel, an indication of direction of travel for the ISSB. Um, while again, the prototypes are not necessarily designed for, um, for consultation or uh, public exposure, uh, public comments rather, certainly be ready to share views as we would expect the ISSB to move into various consultations and comment periods and such as they quickly move into standard setting in 2022. And then um, more broadly, plan to engage the ISSB standards uh, development process or standard setting process on a more on ongoing basis. And so um, a lot of big announcements here, but really want to try to keep this as simple as we can that would very much point to the continued use of the SASB standards and the IR framework in the, in the next steps here. And then a lot more to come around the ISSB and their expected uh, use of the SASB standards. Next slide, please. In terms of next steps, we're expecting um, uh, very soon announcements from the IFRS Foundation around ISSB board leadership and appointments to the positions of chair and uh, vice chair or vice chairs. Um, we expect the ISSB to then move into consultations or even comment periods around the uh, general requirement standard and the climate standard, as well as a work plan and agenda consultation and such. Um, working through advisory group structure will be really important, especially for a lot of our SAG members that I'm sure some are on the line today. Um, again, we look to complete the consolidation by mid-2022. And one other aspect that I'll just mention briefly is around location. Um, the, in, the, in the announcing the establishment of the ISSB, the IFRS Foundation has confirmed that they do expect to have a multi-location operating model for the ISSB, including key locations in, in Frankfurt and Montreal, as well as uh, San Francisco, London, and Asian office, very likely. So more to come there, but I think that's an exciting development for a global standard setter to have that really multi-location uh, presence around the world. Just a little bit more around the context and framing for the rest of the meeting here today. And um, just to be you know, as clear as possible with the standards board and observers from the public, I think it's extremely important that in the near term here, the standards board and technical staff remain focused on our active set of, of projects, really our portfolio of research projects and standard setting projects. And I think that's extremely important because of this clear view and really recommendation by the TRWG, as well as the strategic agreements that 
the VRF and IFRS Foundation have, have uh, made around the ISSB's use of the SASB standards. And so, as we all know, we have an active, uh, meaningful standard setting process up and running with a portfolio of projects. We're going to increasingly work through transition planning to take a view on how this, this portfolio of projects can best or most effectively transition uh, in the direction of the ISSB to give them an even stronger start around developing industry disclosure requirements. Um, we have you know, a great deal of you know, market engagements and research that have been conducted on quite a variety of projects. These projects are all at different points in, in the project development life cycle. Uh, Lynn will touch on this a little bit later. And um, it's going to be really important to take a, a clear view on how, again, to best transition, either complete these projects in the relatively near term or transition them in as constructive and effective of a way as possible um, in the direction of the ISSB. So again, just really important that as we move into more of the, the technical standard setting content in the meeting today, that we, we have this framing in mind to know that, um, uh, that, that the SASB standards, including updates that we recently made and will likely the board will likely continue to make in the near term, are designed to be constructive for the ISSB standard setting efforts and really, again, leverage all of the market input um, and engagement that the staff and board have, have been working on um, uh, for, for really you know, years here on various projects and issues and such. Um, so with that said, Jeff, I uh, would certainly welcome any further comments from, from you. Um, any questions from the board? Otherwise, very much look forward to moving more into the uh, the bulk of the meeting today and diving into quite a number of projects. Thanks, Brian. Um, There's a great overview of, of all the significant changes uh, that are are um, in process. Is I guess the best way to think about this. This is definitely a a time of transition, and uh, you know I think of it as the uh, the SASB Standards Board does still exist. Uh, the IWSB does not yet really uh, have a board uh, yet, but the, there's a transition process there. So uh, that's an important thing for us to help to facilitate. And, uh, you know, I also think of it as we, we are not saying, you know, to the IWSB, you start your work and we'll stop doing our work. It really is uh, very much a, a transition process where our standards and staff are going to be consolidated into uh, the IFRS Foundation to, to help establish that board. So a lot yet to be determined over the coming months, but uh, but, a, but, a, but a great way to sort of set it up and I appreciate the, the overview. Uh, Kurt, looks like you got a question. Kurt, are you on mute? I can't, I can't hear you. I can see you. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just more, more of a comment, I guess. You know, this is uh, dramatic and exciting news, and uh, clearly, uh, you know, this whole process of beginning to harmonize and rationalize the alphabet soup, I guess, over the last year or so, um, has uh, has made incredible progress. And certainly, the thing that I hear most frequently and prevalently from issuers, fellow CFOs, and others is you know, try to bring this together so there gets to be, you know, more consistency across the globe and uh, we're not pestered uh, for various different issues. And so hopefully, you know, by SASB merging into this, we have a big impact and make sure we remain investor focused, but also it begins to uh, reduce the, uh, you know, the overflow of requests that so many companies are struggling with. So. Full speed ahead, and Brian, you're doing uh, important work there, so keep it up. <clears throat> really, thank, thank you for the comments, Kurt. Really full team and organizational effort, including a number of standards board members here. So thank you, Kurt. Great. Great, should we, um, should we move to the next session? Uh, um, next part of the session, I invite Lynn to, to join us for that. Hi, hi, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. And just to, to give a heads up, I think I'm not having full on technical issues, but things are a little glitchy. So if there are audio issues, do let me know um, and we'll hopefully troubleshoot through it. All right. Good luck. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Great.
Well, thank, thank you, Jeff. And then um, appreciate the context and background that Brian set. And we'll just take the next five to 10 minutes to take a look at our set of current standard setting um, agenda and research. Um, as you know, we, we anticipate a lot of those that are listening are interested, you know, what happens to our current body of work? What is our thinking? Um, so if you can go to the next slide. To that. Wanted to just um, announced that we did update three of the industry standards at the beginning of December. Um, it is for the asset management and custody activities standard in the financial sector, as well as the coal operations and metals and mining standards in our extractive uh, sector. And these two, all three of these updates are um, culminating from our work on two standard setting projects and the changes are effective for reporting periods um, beginning on or after January 1st of 2022. We do want to, of course, note that these are voluntary standards. And so if um, there's need to delay on implementing the updates as you get as preparers are gathering data, um, absolutely, we, we recommend um, continuing to provide that context in disclosures um, as, um, in accordance to our standard uh, application guidance um, on modifications and missions. But very quickly, wanted to highlight what so first on the asset management and custodies activity standard um, the update was a removal of the systemic risk management disclosure topic and the associated metrics and um, did want to note that this update of removing this disclosure topic is specific to the asset management and custodies activity standard this disclosure topic and metrics is present in other financial sector standards and wanted to be aware that this is not that update was not applied to other industries um, aside from asset management. Um, we won't go into detail around the rationale um, for this change at today's update, to just given um, limitations on time. I do invite anyone who is interested to understand more to take a look at the basis for conclusions that is linked here. And then switching over to the extractive side in the coal operations and metals and mining standard, um, the update was the result of our tailings management extractives project. Um, it was the addition of a new tailing storage facilities management disclosure topic in both of the standards, um, which includes three new metrics that um, further go into the uh, ESG issues around you know, tailings and waste management in these industries. And then equally in the current waste and hazardous materials disclosure topics, um, we, we further refined and added a few additional metrics um, that we heard were of interest by the market. Um, again, equally, we'll not go through all the rationale here today. The basis for conclusions is also um, linked. I did want to let everybody know that these there were three standards that were updated um, earlier this month, and um, this also is our first set of standards updates uh, since the codified standards. So you can download all of these new standards at our main website, um, sasb.org, standards download. So pivot from that to the next slide into then taking a look at our current set of projects. Um, I think this is a slide familiar to those who, who frequently join our board meetings. I mean, essentially, this is a, the set of current both research areas that we're looking at, research projects, as well as standard setting activities um, on that the technical staff and the board has been looking at. Three of uh, these sessions, as noted with the red rectangle box, will be discussed in further detail today, including two um, new standard setting project proposals, so one on human capital and diversity and inclusion specifically, and another on greenhouse gas emissions in the marine transportation um, industry. Additionally, um, we'll have an around what we heard back from the public comment period for the raw material sourcing in apparel project and um, discuss with the board next steps. Um, so I won't go into all the other projects um, that you see listed here today, but if we can go to the next slide, did want to highlight our kind of plan for looking into the first half of next year on some of these other projects and milestones um, we're aiming to reach. So 
we'll go through this list. So with raw material sourcing, um, we, as mentioned, have received public comments that further inform our thinking around these standard setting activities and are looking to um, further deliberate this with the board and, and um, aim to issue either final standards update based on these projects, or we'll re-expose and conduct additional pu public comment with any additional changes in this first half of the year. So for those interested in apparel project, definitely encourage you to sign up for the project alerts on that project page if you have not already, um, just get to um, keep an eye on our activities there. And then some other projects um, that aren't discussed today, one is around our plastics um, risks and opportunities project. We're looking to issue the exposure draft um, for a public comment period in the first half of this year um, for our research so far and equally for the content governance in internet media and services industry. Um, so again, those in, in kind of chemicals, pulp and paper industries, um, or tracking um, technology sector, these are two, two projects um, and updates. You may want to sign up for alerts and follow along in the next few months. And then um, our alternative products and food and beverage standard setting project continues for three of our food and beverage industries. Um, we're continue staff to work on market consultation and research and also um, believe potentially around end of the first half of the year and maybe ready also for issuing an exposure draft. Uh, so those those are the four where, where I think, you know, for, for anyone who is tracking those industries, you know, our preparers or investors uh, that we, we have big milestones coming up on public comments where we would certainly welcome um, your further feedback and reactions um, to our suggested changes. And then um, the Renewable Energy and Electric Utilities Project will continue on. Um, for any on the line appreciative, you have been a part of our consultation process in the last uh, quarter. We'll continue to do so and continue to um, work on developing the, the um, potential proposed changes in the coming first half of the year, although at this point, um, not necessarily seeing that it would be out for um, public comment during that period. And of course, just wanted to flag, um, we, of course, pending today's board vote decisions on the two project proposals, we would be adding um, the human capital diversity and inclusion, as well as greenhouse gas emissions in marine transportation projects to our standard setting um, project portfolio. And as usual, um, just wanted to call out the link at the bottom that at any time you're curious on what is in our project portfolio, we have a project page that you can reference to see um, the status. And then one more slide, if we can go to the next one, is in addition to the standard setting projects, we also are monitoring some key issues and key um, research topics in the market. I wanted to just call attention to, to two um, prominent ones that really we have our eyes on. One first is around for the financial services sector, um, around looking at finance emissions. Um, recognize there is global interest and in a lot of different movements around um, how to further you know, measure greenhouse gas emissions that's associated with loans and investment portfolios. Um, so this is an area that staff is continuing to monitor and, and you know, track what are the different progress. And um, so if you are you know, involved in, in such areas, please, please do not hesitate to reach out to our financials um, sector lead, Emily Gaston, and um, further you know, discuss with her this area. And then also we know there is uh, human capital continues to be a big area. While today we have a standard setting proposal focused on the diversity and inclusion piece, um, we do want to let everyone know that we continue to monitor the other key themes that have been identified around human capital. Um, and um, staff will continue to um, figure out kind of the work plan on how to further pursue this in our standard setting activities. Uh, so with that, then I will go ahead and turn it over back to Jeff. Um, this is a high, very high level look at our other portfolio projects. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Um, appreciate the overview. Um, I'm sure the rest of the, the board and our listeners uh, do as well. Uh, and uh, I would welcome, welcome Taylor. Uh, and I think Sam, uh, Sam Wallace is also here. Um, he may not be on camera, but uh, he's also supporting this effort. So uh, Taylor Reed, this is uh, uh, the first time we're going to see you today. We, we uh, appreciate you being here on, 
uh, for multiple reasons today. So uh, this is this is part of a, a very big project uh, on human capital. It relates uh, very much to what Lynn was just talking about. So uh, Taylor, why don't I go ahead and pass it over to you? Certainly. Thanks, Jeff. As Jeff noted, I will be presenting the diversity, equity, and inclusion standard setting proposal, but I'm also supported by Sam Wallace, who is also an analyst on the SASB standards research team and may join us for the discussion period. Let me make sure I can move my slides here. There we go. So for today's agenda, I will be walking through staff's rationale for standard setting. We will talk about our approach to industry selection for standard setting and then go into some of the details of the proposal. And the objective for today's session is to gain the standards board vote on the diversity, equity and inclusion standard setting proposal. To outline the opportunity we have here, we have identified significant investor interest and evidence connecting diversity, equity, and inclusion to enterprise value creation, which suggests that there are opportunities to strengthen how the standards capture the issue of DEI. And we're recommending that the standards board approve a standard setting project that will address diversity, equity, and inclusion in 45 industries and focus on adding or revising topics to better account for this issue and how it impacts enterprise value across the proposed industries. As a reminder, this standard setting project, uh, this standard setting proposal stems from our work on human capital and in specific our human capital research project, which identified five key sub themes of human capital. These themes were surfaced through our research. Re So let's see. Looks like we might have lost uh, we lost Taylor. Um, not sure whether or not. Uh, let's see. She gonna be able to jump back in. Um, I don't know if if Sam is is able to to jump on screen and, and pick this up. Yeah, Jeff has my. Yeah, I, I guess I'm here, so I, I have the script. I can do it. Um, Right, and this was this was Taylor's uh, like devious way to like draw you in. So uh, uh, happy to Greg or, or Sam, however you guys want to manage this, but uh, appreciate you jumping in. Yeah, sure. So let's um, go ahead and start working here. And sorry, I'm going to probably be doing a little more reading than Taylor would be doing, but um, can probably hey, Sam? deal with the content here. Yep. Um, I have audio. I'm happy to continue if you would like. I just may not have video. I'm not sure. That would be great. Okay. Oh, and there you are Wonderful. again. Yeah, we're we're having some. I'm having some WebEx issues or some GoTo webinar issues. So I'm actually going to turn off my camera. It's a little wonky there. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going if that's all right, and hopefully if I cut out again, somebody will jump in and let me know. All righty. Um, let's go ahead and I'm going to move into our rationale for standard setting and specifically talk about the evidence we've gathered for investor interest and evidence of financial impact. 
So to understand the investor perspective on DEI, <coughs> staff reviewed and analyzed company policies, proxy voting, engagement guides, stewardship reports, investor communications, shareholder resolutions, SEC comment letters, and we held numerous market consultations to gain firsthand market input on the issue. And through our analysis, we determined that there is a high degree of investor interest in how firms uh, manage and perform on issues related to DEI, and that investors currently lack decision useful comparable data on the issue. Most of this evidence was initially presented at the July Standards Board meeting, but I'm gonna spend a few minutes here reiterating some of the key points that demonstrate the investor perspective on DEI and are a key part of our rationale for standard setting. So staff reviewed company policies, proxy voting guidelines, engagement guides, and stewardship reports for 67 different asset owners and managers to understand how investors across the world are thinking about DEI. And of those 67 firms analyzed, 85% of them published policies, engagement practices, or voting guidelines focused on diversity. 84% of those materials were focused on board diversity, while 60% also highlighted workforce diversity. And in addition, 85% were focused on gender diversity, and 75% of those materials also focused on racial and ethnic diversity. So a large proportion of asset managers and owners are producing materials that demonstrate their interest in this issue. Of those 67 firms that staff reviewed, we observed that the materials varied slightly by geographic region. We found that a majority of the firms analyzed in North America and the EU plus the UK had policies, practices, and guidelines that were focused on both board and workforce diversity, while a lower proportion of APRAC firms had such policies. And when analyzing firms with policies, practices, and guidelines related to workforce diversity in specific, 70% of North American firms have these policies, 40% of firms in the EU and the UK, and 20% of APAC firms. This analysis indicates that investors in different regions may think about DEI issues differently, which is consistent with what we've heard in investor consultations that we've held uh, thus far. This highlights the theme that staff will need to prioritize if the project is approved, specifically that the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion is often perceived differently in various regions and countries and will therefore remain a key focus throughout our research and consultation efforts. Another indicator of growing investor interest in these issues can be demonstrated by the growing number of shareholder resolutions we've seen focused on DEI. Between 2018 and 2021, the percentage of resolutions filed that were focused on diversity nearly doubled from 7% in 2018 to nearly 12% in 2021. And of these, shareholder resolutions focused on workforce diversity grew significantly relative to those focused on board diversity. In addition, we saw shareholder support for resolutions focused on board diversity and workforce diversity increased between 2019 and 2020. Looking at more granular data on investor support for DEI resolutions, the Harvard Law School Forum on Corporate Governance suggested that calls for workforce diversity data gained, uh, gained considerable momentum this year due to multiple shareholder campaigns, which led to a quadrupling of resolutions filed. And there have been several investor-led engagement campaigns to enhance disclosure on the issue, and while the amount of disclosure on DEI measures is increasing, 
proposals are still making it to a vote and receiving overwhelming support from investors. So for example, here we can see that multiple votes received majority support from investors, some reaching as high as 80 and 90%, which is not common. And this increasing support may be due to the fact that large asset managers like Vanguard and State Street and proxy advisory groups like ISS and Glass Lewis are increasingly holding committee chairs accountable if their boards fail to disclose or lack diversity. So together, these data points, along with our market consultation with investors across the world, demonstrate that investors are increasingly interested in DEI. In addition to that evidence of investor interest, we sought to understand how the issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion impacts business outcomes. And to do this, we reviewed more than 50 academic studies, a multitude of studies and market research from consulting groups and different civil society organizations. We also performed a systematic review of corporate disclosures from 164 companies headquartered in and operating across countries and sectors. And we've held numerous market consultations to help build our hypothesis on the ways that DEI is most likely to impact firm value. From this analysis, we've determined that the ways that DEI is most likely to impact business performance can be organized into four channels. Let me back up here. Sorry about that. Uh, those are talent attraction and retention. This is the role that DEI plays in a firm's ability to attract and retain talent. Marketing, design, sorry, product design, marketing, and delivery, which is the role DEI plays in enhancing product and service value proposition for consumers. Then community relations, which is how DEI uh, impacts a company's ability to identify, engage, and manage issues related to the communities in which they operate. And then innovation and risk recognition, which is the role uh, that DEI plays in a firm's ability to innovate and recognize risk. I'm gonna come back to those channels of business relevance um, in a moment here, but move on to staff's approach to identifying industries for the proposal. So here we're looking at a visualization of staff's approach to selecting industries for the proposal. First, we drew from that research on investor interest in DEI and evidence of financial impact to determine the ways in which proactive or mismanagement of DEI is most likely to impact business outcomes. And these are the four channels of business relevance, which I just spoke through. Next, we defined each of those channels and identified a set of industry characteristics and accompanying indicators for each channel that would help demonstrate whether the channel is likely to be relevant within a particular industry. So for example, the characteristics and indicators that we sought to understand and determine the relevance of the talent attraction and retention channel within a particular industry would have consisted of evidence that the industry faces a sustained labor shortage, maybe has an aging workforce, and low rates of diversity. And then this slide uh, contains a snapshot of the characteristics and indicators that we identified for each channel to help create our criteria for gathering evidence. And I know this is a lot of information and I'm not gonna walk through each bullet. And I will note that half of them are, uh, are bolded, which is just a, just a factor of um, formatting, I believe. So just wanted to pause here and just share a, a bit of this list because I think it's valuable to kind of show the types of information that we sought to rationalize the inclusion of industries in the proposal. 
see if I can advance to the next slide. There we go. So if we were able to gather evidence of those characteristics and indicators from one or more of our channels of business relevance, then the industry was included in the proposal. And before I move on to a specific example of evidence that we gathered for an industry, I want to emphasize that staff aimed to apply its criteria consistently and invested a great deal of time and effort into investigating each of these channels across all 77 industries. And we were often able to supplement our research with market input as well as industry specific evidence that linked DEI initiatives to financial outcomes. And we're confident in our rationale that we've constructed for each industry included in the proposal. However, I will point out that as you can imagine, it is an enormous undertaking to gather evidence for four channels across 77 industries while also accounting for the unique international context of each industry. And the reason I'm pointing this out uh, is because if the project is approved, staff intends to enhance our body of evidence during our research and consultation phase and continue to work with the board to adjust the scope of the project as needed. So I will come back to a few of those points in a moment, but I'm going to return to our approach to industry selection and move to the next slide. There we go. So these are the characteristics and indicators that we identified to help demonstrate the relevance of the talent attraction and retention channel for each industry. I already mentioned the evidence of the same labor shortages and an aging workforce. Other characteristics and indicators include low rates of gender and ethnic diversity in the workforce or at the management level, the prevalence of discrimination lawsuits, and high attrition among workers from an underrepresented group. So here we're looking at a snapshot of the evidence compiled to form the rationale for the engineering and construction services and home builders industries. So for example, here we can see that global leaders in the industry believe that skilled labor will have a high impact on the industry for years to come. Uh, statistics from the US show that the workforce is predominantly male. In the US, there's a large proportion of the industry's workforce that is aging and will retire in the coming decade. Uh, a concern as research suggests that the younger generation isn't interested in the construction industry. There are documented instances of discrimination across countries and some industry associations have dedicated programs to enhancing DEI as a specific strategy to meet uh, its labor needs. One thing about this example is it highlights the social impact that companies within each of these industries, the engineering, construction, as well as home builders industries, can have by focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion when attracting and retaining talent. And more specifically, they can enhance the opportunity and equity for traditionally underrepresented individuals within their industry. But this isn't the only social impact that companies can have by proactively managing and investing in DEI. If approved, the project would aim to capture a much broader set of social impacts associated with the issue. So for example, Construction companies may also be able to improve the health and safety of their workforce by building a diverse and inclusive workforce and culture where individuals are able to voice concerns without fear of repercussion and learn to execute safety precautions effectively. Another example might be um, biotech and pharma companies that may be able to produce better and safer products by enhancing the diversity of the participants in their clinical trials. 
And I'm specifically highlighting this because it's important to note that given the unique industries and social impacts, it's unlikely that the outcome of this project will be a uniform set of diversity metrics in all industries proposed for standard setting. So with that, I will move on to our proposal and walk through the industries that we are proposing for standard setting. So here we're looking at the list of 45 industries that staff has established evidence for one or more channels of business relevance. And of these 45 industries, four industries already have a topic on employee engagement diversity and inclusion that staff think may be further revised. Here, this is a list of the industries that are proposed for standard setting, which are highlighted in red, and the industries that are not proposed but have an existing topic on employee engagement, diversity, and inclusion, and those are highlighted in pink. And together, this list makes up 53 industries. And then finally, here, I've listed all 77 six industries and containing the industries that we are proposing for standard setting in red and then those that have the existing employee engagement, diversity, and inclusion topics in pink. And then those industries that staff did not find sufficient evidence for and is not including in the standard setting proposal. <clears throat> And this is where I'm going to come back to a few points I made earlier in that staff aim to apply its criteria for gathering evidence consistently across all industries. And as a result, we cast a wide net in determining which industry to include in the standard setting proposals, in the standard setting proposal, excuse me. And if approved, we hope to continue to engage the market to refine this list and build our understanding of the channels across industries and on an international basis. Therefore, staff hopes to engage the standards board on the scope of the project on an ongoing basis if approved. And with that, um, hopefully I can get my camera to work, but I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff to start us off with any additional discussion that the board would like to pursue. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, definitely appreciate you giving us the, the, the overview of the project proposal and, uh, and for um, managing the, the, uh, the go-to webinar issues that seem to be pervasive today. Um, oh, but, but we do see you as well, so uh, excellent. It um, uh, looks like uh, Lloyd has got a, a question or a comment, so uh, I'll pass it over to Lloyd. Uh, quick comment and then a question. Um, the comment very high degree of difficulty project and really impressive progress on it. Congratulations. I think um, this is the clearest I've seen uh, the issues outlined and um, fantastic work um, so far. Question on the industries. Um, uh, obviously, we're coming up to vote on whether to initiate the standard setting progress. Are the industries that have been selected set in stone or is that something that would be subject to some later consultation and feedback? Yes, this is the initial set of industries that we've identified evidence for, but as I mentioned, um, this would be an area of focus for research and consultation to kind of refine the list if needed, continue to gather evidence, and adjust the list if necessary, and that would be a conversation we would want to have with the board. So. Um, it's, it's the conclusion we've come to at this point, but I think that just as we've done with other standard setting projects, if we uncover new evidence that suggests that the scope should be altered, that's on the table um, and up to the board to, to discuss. Great, thank you. Thanks, Lloyd. Um, Bob, looks like you're, you're next. All right, so Bob, I, we can't hear you, I think. I can't hear you. Hey, there, I was I was muted by the organizer. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, so thanks. I had that same comment that uh, Lloyd had on, could the industries change? And with respect to that, maybe, um, you know, two, two couple of comments here. 
BlackRock and other institutional investors have laid out a request that you know diversity of the board and workforce be reported, and they've made that comment without respect to industry. So I understand the way that you've laid this out on enterprise value, which is really important, but maybe something to continue to think about that this this seems to be an item. You know, we can argue material or not, enterprise value or not, that groups of investors have laid out as a you know, non-negotiable disclosure item. So that's point number one. Point number two, and, and, and Lloyd said it too, this is a significant project. You know, I'm really pleased to see that we've been able to get some secondments from different organizations into the SASB organization. And obviously our, you know, the SASB brand and everything that's going on is getting significant interest. So perhaps there's an opportunity for you to supplement your staff uh, on this project, because it is pretty discreet. It is pretty focused, you know, there's gonna be an, an end date on that, so I'd encourage you to think about that. And then one interesting tie-in to, um, to everything you're doing uh, related to innovation is technology. You know, this whole issue of labor shortage and what is occurring there is the, lack of a better word, the challenge, but the opportunity to find ways to use automation and technology to make up for some of that labor shortage. So that's a little bit of a, of a, of a disjointed comment. But again, thanks for all of the great support. I think, again, what differentiates us in such a positive way is, you know, getting out there and getting the facts. And again, all of your um, input from issuers and investors really, really helps, I think, the board uh, make a much better informed and confident decision as we move along. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. Um, what, one thing I would note is that you know, I think that the, the part of the, the work here that is challenging that, that you and Lloyd both mentioned is that uh, uh, you know, it's very you know it's very important to understand why uh, investors are asking for the information that they're asking for in part because uh, we we have a, a very clear mission which is around facilitating the decision making with respect to enterprise value creation and so. Um, so that that's an important part, uh, and and of course materiality is then going to fit right into that. Uh, you know, thinking about what a business actually does and how it might manage that. So, um, really a, a challenging aspect of this. I, I see that uh, we have uh, three in queue, but I just want to make sure that we also uh, are able to get everybody who who isn't able to jump on camera. So, uh, Suzanne, if you're if you're there, we might jump to you next, uh, and then and then go to the, the board members on camera. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and unfortunately, I cannot go on camera. So my question was uh, along the same line. So should we expect that those uh, sectors that are not eligible right now would then choose to use these disclosures for, you know, for inspiration and that therefore it would be uh, by common practice a more default uh, uh, sector agnostic uh, set of disclosures? If I understood your uh, question correctly, um, if we develop diversity, equity, and inclusion metrics for a particular industry and not for another industry, and a company within the industry that does not have DEI metrics would like to use those DEI metrics for an um, industry standard outside of its primary industry and sector, that is completely fine um, and in fact with many of the companies that i speak to if there's a particular topic or metric that they identify as impacting their business um, but it's not in their primary industry standard they will kind of pull from the applicable industry standards and use those metrics to disclose so hopefully that got to your yeah, question a little bit. No, I think that that was uh, that was clear, and I think it's also to say fully supportive of the sector-specific approach that you've taken, which is uh, an extra layer to all the research you've already done. Uh, but I could easily see that it would become uh, a more generic uh, approach. But thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I, I would just also um, follow on Taylor's comments there and mention that we do. 
have uh, the, the human capital bulletin, which uh, takes a, a collection of all the human capital metrics uh, and disclosure topics that are already in the SASB standards, groups them together, and, uh, and is a resource that companies can use to the extent that they are looking for guidance on something that's not in their industry standard. That is one resource that they could, they could also look to uh, voluntarily to, to use. Uh, so with that, uh, Mark, I think you were next in, in the queue. Sure, thanks, Jeff. And um, Taylor, let me just add the kudos uh, that everybody else is giving too. I think um, what I particularly love about the top-down and bottom-up approach that that the staff has has done here, it's really additive to to everything I've seen uh, in the literature. Um, the 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 sector-specific approach and this whole understanding of why um, these this DE and I might be relevant could lead to potentially something different in different industries. It, it might not, it might, um, but but to build on Suzanne's point, like I think it's like if we understand and we add to the literature why it's relevant in certain industries or not, even if the other industry doesn't have it, but they particularly think that one of those reasons resonates with them, they could pick the industry that has that same basis for, for why to, to volunteer to, to do some of these disclosures. So that's why I think it's it's um, it's particularly additive. Um, and, and as others have said, this this may or may not be set in stone in terms of the number of industries and, and the market input that you're going to get and have gotten can be can be useful in, in figuring out the industry um, breakdown. Um, the other sort of thing that I wanted to bring up was was on the community relations um, business cha channel of business relevance. Um, if you could just help me understand, like I, 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 I haven't loved that that label. Um, you know, to me, is it sort of, is it, if I were to shortcut it, is it sort of like local community externalities would be a, would be a, could, could you just hum a couple more bars on, on, on what we mean by community relations? Because I think a lay person, when they hear community lay relations might not be after the same thing that you're pointing out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're on the right track there, Mark. Uh, so the characteristics here we're talking about are industries where operations typically result in social and environmental externalities that adversely impact the communities that surround its operations or the, the, you know, the communities that are impacted by those social and environmental externalities. So the common ones that we can think of in terms of examples could be something related to um, the oil and gas, midstream industry, I believe, basically the oil and gas industry that um, develops pipelines and then metals and mining. So metals and mining would be another example. Great. Thank you. It's helpful. There it is. I want to add my congratulations and thanks also for seeing this project um, to this stage and I'm very supportive of, of this project in particular. Um, perhaps one comment just riffing off of, of um, Mark's question and, and maybe Elizabeth was thinking along the same lines is, you know, the, the definition of community might be changing in a, in a global international sense and, and so we might think of sort of the community impacts or social impacts as, as um, a result of, you know, internet, community, uh, social media kind of channels as well, and, and that's something we could we could look at. Um, I wanna I wanted to comment, uh, and and again, thank you for acknowledging that the scope of industries could expand or uh, contract as you learn more from the market and and gather more feedback from the market. Um, it was really helpful to see which are already covered on this issue and which industries would be proposed for additional work and which are not ex, uh, proposed for this project. And my question is really about um, understanding more about really the discipline you're, you're bringing to um, this task of evaluating evidence of these financial impact and these channels. Um, and Hoping that I can, you can still hear me if I turn off my video because I, I don't know if I was coming through. But my question is about, um, you know, 
the evidence you required when evaluating a potential industry and you know what you might be looking for from additional market feedback could you talk about beyond industry associations or industry uh, reports when you looked at company specific evidence were you looking for a certain number of companies uh, demonstrating these these channels and characteristics within an industry of certain minimum number or certain amount of percentage of market cap or, or some kind of qualifier? Um, we didn't take a, kind of a check the box approach for each industry. Um, usually we there would be sufficient evidence for us to feel pretty confident in including an industry um so you know it wasn't just like one one study or one example or one company disclosure it was you know we have a database full of evidence different pieces of evidence for different industries and then we typically looked for examples in various products segments. So for example, in the apparel industry, we would be looking at luxury companies and kind of branding, general branding companies. Um, we would be looking, for examples in annual reports and SEC filings. So looking at companies from different areas of the world, different sizes. So we didn't take a, a check the box approach per se, but rather kind of a very comprehensive um, mosaic, if you will. The one place where that was probably slightly different is on the innovation and risk recognition uh, channel, just because we found that a lot of the company disclosure that ties diversity, equity, and inclusion to innovation and risk recognition was relatively boilerplate and non-specific so we felt like we should acknowledge that companies indicate through their filings and their disclosures that they are thinking about diversity and inclusion when it comes to innovation um, but the tangible examples and evidence are harder to nail down so in that case we did look for kind of several examples of companies within an industry um, having that type of language in their disclosures rather than just kind of one example because it was it was rather for their place. Thanks, Taylor. And then Verity, actually one other thing I'd like to note there is um, the set of industry characteristics and indicators that we use to kind of guide our criteria are included in the appendix of this slide and they will be posted on the project webpage. And um, so if the public has additional um, comments on that or would like to use it as a resource in terms of helping us identify the evidence that we're seeking, um, that information will be available. That's great, thanks for mentioning that. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Bernie, for the question. Um, Elizabeth, you've been very patient. Yep. yep, and I just have a quick comment. I don't, I don't have any additional questions. I think, I think um, others did that. Um, but just, a, just a comment. I think, you know, on diversity, just like many ESG and sustainability topics, there's a lot of conventional wisdom, um, and I, I just love, love, love the the depth of the research here to think about. Well, is it is it material or is it relevant? And if so, why why is that? And getting to the research, and I think it's a great example of what SASB brings to the table in thinking about these topics and, and taking an industry industry relevant approach. So I, I just want to say congratulations on doing that. I know it's been a lot to go through, and I hope that um, an outcome of this is actually maybe a guide or tool for investors for how they can think about these issues in the context of value, enterprise value, value creation, that sort of thing. I, I, I would, you know, I don't want this research just to just to become standards. And, and standards are important too, but I think this research can be utilized in, in another meaningful way and would encourage us all to think about how we can do that at, at the conclusion of this work. So anyways, that's it, just a comment and thank you.
Thanks, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, standards are also beautiful in their own right, just just as a thing themselves. We, we I know. I, I of course, of course, they are. As an investor myself, also love the analysis, so would love to see it um, used by others. Thanks. Absolutely. That, th thanks for that comment. Uh, and and Dan. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jim. And yeah, Taylor. Thanks for your your work on this. I do think this is an important project. You assembled a lot of evidence of the importance of it to investors. And so you know, I, th I think it's very appropriate that we're devoting our effort to it. I, I, I guess I, I wanted to say first, kind of, kind of in line with what others have said, but I really like the approach of identifying from the literature, the channels of impact on enterprise value or on the business, then looking for industries that have those characteristics and then looking for evidence in those industries. I, I really think that's a great model. And, and one that can be applied to other kinds of cross-cutting issues as, as well. For so, thanks for that. I mean, just the the one thing I, I I guess I'll say this is a question. I don't know that I really expect you to have an answer for it at, at this point. But I, kind of beginning with the slide you had on firm policies across different regions and kind of you know the wide swing and in interest in diversity at the workforce level, and then thinking about different regions and in countries, it, it does seem to me one of the really difficult tricks here is going to be coming up with metrics that are, you know, applicable generally. And sort of, in a sense, maybe there's some tension between that aspect of this project and our general efforts to internationalize the the standards. So I'm not, I don't have an answer for how you ought to deal with it. I don't know if if you do either at, at this point, but that's just this one thing that strikes me about the challenges to this project. You're right, Dan, that has already come up in our research and in our consultations with companies and investors. Um, it is a challenge that we fully acknowledge and probably don't even fully understand the extent of, but as I mentioned, is going to be a top focus for us in gaining market input and trying to identify the guidance we can provide to illicit disclosures that are comparable um, and useful to investors. So certainly a challenge that we anticipate and don't have the answer to yet. Thanks. Good luck. Thanks. Yeah, maybe just uh, following on, on Dan's uh, comment there, you know, one of the things I, I think about is like this, this approach uh, really helps to, to, to clarify where we're expecting diversity, equity, inclusion to be particularly important. Uh, and, and I think the, the thing that isn't quite as clear in, in this part yet, but I know it's part of the thinking that underlies it and, and ultimately what we're going to see developed is, is and this, does, this is the part that relates back to Dan's point, I think, which is like, wh what are the aspects of human capital that need to be managed in a particular way for particular industries, given the, you know, their business activities, what they ask of their employees and uh, you know what the particular challenges are going to be. So you know diversity, equity, inclusion is a broad set that you know even you know, it's a it's a part of human capital management, but even itself it's still quite broad and and there's a lot of research on the different aspects of it. And so I know that's just part of the challenge here and, and ultimately what will result in the specific disclosure topics. And you, you hit on that a bit uh, as well. So uh, just uh, respecting that this is a this is a very important and also Pretty challenging uh, project, but I think uh, tremendous opportunity to expand the coverage of, of this uh, within the, the SASB standards. So, uh, so, so great. Maybe with that, um, uh, and you know, of course, if any board members have any final thoughts or, or questions, they can they can jump in. But I might also invite Lynn back uh, just to uh, to join here for a second to to sort of summarize before we, we call up for a, a board vote. Um, uh, so, so Taylor, uh, Lynn, you wanna summarize it, anything that um, you heard from the board or takeaways? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, well, Taylor Taylor went through and, and shared our, our thinking kind of on our standard setting work around diversity and inclusion, which stem from our broader human capital projects. So definitely do want to note that we recognize this is one piece of the human capital discussion. Um, and equally, we are excited to, to continue moving this forward and seeing how it manifests in specific um, sections. Um, I think, you know, we heard from the board definitely there's recognition that this is the initial starting set of industries. They're 
is likely and, and maybe broader interest in other industries not included in the scope. And, and I think equally staff um, shares the view. This is a great starting point to start um, looking at this initial set of industries. We very much welcome market feedback, um, participation to further build on on the research that Taylor has shared, the staff has done up to date um, to further finesse this list and explore, you know, also further how this applies on maybe a broader thematic level. Um, there are a couple, um, I think, discussions that the board brought up around certain channels that, you know, we, we also will continue to make sure it's clear and, and um, for, for the market as well as the board and, and the understanding. Um, but otherwise, um, we, we are very interested in, you know, sharing with the board this proposal and looking forward to the board's vote um, on this issue. Great. Um, yeah, so I didn't hear anything that sounded like a, a major a major road stop. So I, I think we're, we're certainly ready to, to uh, potentially take a vote on this. Uh, so what we can do is uh, invite the board members, if you can turn on your camera, that will facilitate that. Uh, and, uh, and then once we've got the board here, looks like we've got um most but i think we oh actually maybe we do have everyone three six eight, nine ten uh, almost everybody i can't tell who we're missing um so not on this, uh, what's that heard is not on camera but i think he's still with us thank you for the for the quick identification of uh, i am so indeed it is here all right uh do i hear a motion to to approve prove the the initiation of a standard setting project uh, on diversity equity inclusion as proposed by the the staff today so moved thank you verity and a second second all those in favor indicate through uh video format in any way you choose hey. <laughs> Aye. Aye. Any yes. opposed Hearing none, uh, then we'll say that this is uh, this is passed uh, by by unanimous vote. So uh, thanks to the board members for being here today and for the discussion, and uh, and thank you, uh, Taylor, for for all the work that you and Sam have been doing on this uh, in the background and for for presenting on it today. Do you want to quickly just mention sort of next steps? Yes, please. Uh, I can advance to the next slide. I will run through some of our anticipated next. Steps, um, which will largely consist of research and consultation. We're going to continue to build our body of globally applicable evidence. Uh, oh, I'm going to ask someone to mute just in case. Oh. There we go. Um, we will refine our industry list and our list of industry characteristics and indicators if needed. We hope to begin building our preliminary view on disclosure topic scope, as well as mapping those topics to general issue categories. And we will continue to examine channels and industries across international markets. Um, we will begin consultations in 2022. Um, so please feel free to reach out to our staff if you would like to participate uh, early next year. And I will move through the appendix and then hand it off to our next presenter. Actually, I think we are, uh, we're gonna take a break. We're scheduled to do a break now for the, the next 15 minutes. So um, uh, I don't know if we have a break slide, um, but if we don't, we'll, we'll just uh, pause here. Uh, and we'll plan to to come back uh, in 15 minutes at a quarter past an hour in whatever time zone you happen to be in. And uh, uh, remind everybody who is uh, able to speak or keep your cameras on to mute yourself and keep your cameras off uh, during our 15 minute break. And we'll be back. We'll be back shortly.
Okay, um, I'd like to welcome everybody back. Thanks for sticking with us through the break. And um, uh, with that, we'll uh, move into the next part of our, of our agenda today. We've got two more um, sessions to go through, uh, sorry, three, three more uh, parts to go through, uh, but we'll start with the, uh, the marine transportation industry and, uh, and uh, welcome Max uh, uh, Lemerle. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, new to uh, this, uh, this format. I think this is gonna be your first uh, standards board meeting. So uh, uh, welcome Max and you picked a great day for it. We're having a, you know, more technical issues than we typically do. Actually, I'll just attribute it to you since you're, you're the, uh, the difference here today. Uh. Definitely me, fingers crossed, nothing uh, goes wrong in this presentation, but now I've cursed it, so. Yeah, well, so, so so far so good. So uh, thanks for being here today, Max. Yeah, so uh, good morning, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. My name is Max Lemerle, and I will be walking us through the greenhouse gas emissions topic update within the marine transportation standard. So our session objectives for the presentation will be twofold. First, to present the rationale for standard setting, and second, to present staff's recommendation as a result of work we've done to date, which is to initiate standard setting to address some opportunities we've identified to improve the marine transportation standard. At a high level, the overall issue is that the current metrics in the greenhouse gas emissions and air quality disclosure topics in the marine transportation standard lack completeness and comparability in measuring performance regarding greenhouse gas emissions and non-greenhouse gas pollutants. Overall, we would like to evaluate improvements to the metrics in, the, in both the greenhouse gas emissions and air quality disclosure topics in the standard. And to quickly walk you through our rationale for this, uh, you know, starting quickly on emissions overall in the marine transportation industry be have become a subject of increasing focus amongst both major regulatory bodies in addition to industry participants. So this focus began primarily in 2018 when the IMO declared reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to be a top priority. And there have been a few uh, developments since. Notably, uh, October 2021, a pledge was signed by uh, nine companies, including Amazon, Ikea, Unilever, to only move cargo on ships using zero carbon fuels by 2040. Uh, more recently, at the COP26 summit, a coalition of 22 countries, including Britain and the US, uh, created financial incentives to encourage zero emission shipping through a proposal called the Clybank Declaration. As you may remember, in April 2021, the research team convened a working group to assess the marine transportation standard by consulting industry participants, investors, and subject matter experts. This working group resulted in a significant amount of feedback. However, there were two topics in particular that were consistently mentioned as areas that would benefit the most from an update. On this slide, they are highlighted red. It's, as we've discussed, the greenhouse gas emissions topic and the air quality topic. And working group members who we consulted with indicated very strong concerns that these existing disclosure me metrics did not faithfully or completely represent the emissions pro performance of reporting companies um, and highlighted these as very high priority items to update. Uh, so to dig a little bit into the feedback we uh, received, members overall universally agreed that the topic was important, uh, but they argued that there were certain metrics within this topic that were not representationally faithful or complete, specifically, uh, the TRMT 110A.3 Part 3, which is the uh, percentage renewable, uh, was, was one thing members focused on. And um, this is because ships are typically not using renewable energy sources like wind power or solar power to drive emissions efficiency. Like the conversation overall is on transition fuels such as hydrogen fuel cells, ammonia, methanol. Um, and so these transition fuels are seen as a much more relevant conversation overall. Uh, additionally, there was reference to the Energy Efficient Design Efficiency Design Index, uh, that's TRMT 110A.4, uh, and the major focus on this is just that the market overall is converging on another standard. The EEDI is not uh, really used as frequently as an indicator for emissions efficiency. There was also a discussion to add uh, Scope 2 emissions metrics, um, a suggestion, suggestion to include an intensity metric, and then a suggestion to clearly define the methodology used for, for determining emissions efficiency and uh, at a high level, depending on the methodology you use, um, 
your emissions profile will look very different. So defining the methodology uh, was seen as being important. Digging into the air quality metric, um, the primary issue the working group members had was that there was no really generally agreed upon methodology to accurately measure these non-greenhouse gas uh, pollutant emissions. There are some ships that are you know, equipped with scrubbers or sensors that attempt to sort of capture uh, those, those pollutants, um, but it can be very costly. And so the suggestion overall all was to either replace the metric or sort of more importantly, add some qualitative component uh, where companies could have a narrative discussion around their non-greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy. Okay, so then following the working group, we actually uh, dug a little bit into um, company disclosures and we analyzed 17 disclosures aligned with the marine transportation standard and listed as reporters on the website. So of all topics we analyzed, we effectively saw the same thing in the data, which was that uh, the greenhouse gas emissions topic and the air quality topic were frequently modified um, or certain metrics were, were omitted from reporting. And as mentioned, this was consistent with the working group findings um, to dig a little bit more into that data. Um, you can see disclosure alignment overall for that greenhouse gas emissions topic is, is fairly strong. So those, those first three line items, or four line items, sorry, you see actually fairly high alignment compared to the overall reporting average at the bottom, that's 61%. And um, you can see at those last two points that we discussed, the alignment is actually very low. So less than half of companies were in alignment um, with SASB's um, overall reporting methodology. Uh, a good portion of them modified the way in which they reported this data and a large portion admitted. Um, so this high alignment for those first four metrics uh, versus the overall average does echo working group feedback that companies did find this overall useful to report, but we're seeing that uh, pretty clearly that those last two uh, could use a little bit of improvement. Digging into the air quality topic, um, Overall disclosure alignment was, was low across the board with less than half of companies in full alignment. Uh, we did discuss the difficulty of measuring these metrics earlier. So a lot of companies chose to modify um, their, uh, or, or to sort of disclose a different methodology they use to, to capture this. Uh, and this becomes fairly clear when looking at the data. So, so given this, staff's recommendation is um, staff's believes the evidence of investor industry and regulatory interest suggests standard setting is warranted for the marine transportation standard. And this is primarily supported by two factors. One, the increase in market interest, and two, that feedback we've received to date. Um, additionally, in the market interest column, uh, we've seen customer pressure. We mentioned earlier, Amazon, Ikea, Unilever, a bunch of companies coming together to sort of pressure the industry to focus more on emissions. Um, that is a driving factor. Uh, so considering those two factors, the proposed project supports our standard setting agenda and prior, prioritizes uh, both our focuses on climate related research and importantly, uh, demonstrates responsiveness to the market. In addition, there are multiple references in the technical, technical protocols to US based frameworks instead of the internationally applicable International Maritime Organization uh, regulations. And this would benefit from an update. We had multiple working group members point that out as well. Um, overall, the project satisfies the criteria of mission alignment, prevalence, feasibility, and capacity. Uh, specifically, and most importantly, mission alignment. Um, staff believes there's a clear mission alignment to improve communication by companies to investors on these key climate-related risk and opportunity to the industry. And secondly, the reduction in greenhouse gas and non-greenhouse gas emissions is today a very prevalent issue and getting increasingly prevalent um, globally. Uh, in terms of next steps, we sort of have three main categories we'd like to focus on. The first is engaging additional in, uh, industry experts. So this is investors, uh, corporates, various subject matter experts on these issues. A uh, key phase of the process will be to focus specifically on that investor input. And additionally, to contact various organizations in the space, like the International Maritime Organization, to get their input. We would like to assess the project portfolio prioritization and staff resource capacity, 
and identify changes overall that will have the most significant impact on cost effectiveness and decision usefulness and overall provide the most accurate picture of a company's emissions profile to sort of uh, address the working group feedback and feedback from various industry participants. So with that said, I'll turn the floor over to Jeff for discussion and deliberation, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that may come up. Thanks, Max. Um, uh, looks like we're switching the slides. There we go. They're back. Um, give the, uh, the my board members a, a chance to, to to think of their or to jump in with their questions. Um, looks like we've got um, Bob on deck. Uh, Bob, go ahead. You might be on mute, um, possibly an imposed mute. You can. I'm unmuted now. How's that? Yep, sound great. Thanks, Bob. Fantastic. Max, thanks. I thought the uh, the multiple sources of pressure and timeline was really intriguing. So thank you for that. And again, another great example of how not just what we think, but what other things uh, other people think is so important to driving this. Uh, also, for benefit of the audience, the, this whole working group concept I think has been great. You know, as we prepare for this meeting, we've talked about how significant and helpful, you know, the real experts were in advising you and coming up with you know positives about the standards but but where they could be improved and i thought it was interesting to see the desire of the of the working group those and those who have to do the reporting you know wanting to make it better so thank you for that i really liked the um, modification slide that you did in fact jeff as i think about that i know we've had some discussions on what we call disclosure quality you know so how how completely and closely does a company follow different standards and so that was very helpful thank you and um so I guess in conclusion, I, I'm very supportive of this. My, my only question is, did we just get lucky by having a great working group? You know, you'd, you'd think that if we could have this everywhere, we might be having a, a presentation each time. So you don't have to answer that. But again, I think that's just a, a solid, um, you know, uh, circumstance we find ourselves in. And, and thank you uh, for the presentation and thank you for being a, a new member of our staff. Yeah, absolutely. And, and sort of to echo the, uh, the point on the working group feedback, I mean, they were very, sort of forward with providing feedback and very, very helpful. I, uh, as mentioned, I'm fairly new, so I'm not sure if that's universal, but uh, it was it was a really great exercise. Thanks, Max. And yeah, we'll, we'll note that uh, to, to Bob's point, we do, uh, you know, the, I know that the staff is pretty careful to follow the, the disclosures that we see as part of just the regular monitoring that's uh, an ongoing part of our, um, uh, the work that we do, um, and uh, you know, it's less to do with rating or, or ranking or evaluating companies' disclosures, but more to really be a lens through understanding where there may be challenges or or unanticipated costs uh, with respect to the the standards and the and the methods that are are used uh, as as they're currently drafted. Maybe an opportunity for improvement in the standards. So, um, uh, Kurt, looks like you've got a comment or a question. Uh, possibly also on mute. So, uh... yeah, the most frequent phrase in the English language these days, probably That's others. Right. Uh, the uh, just to uh, highlight off of uh, Bob's comment about the working groups. It is uh, a certainly this has been a good one. But the uh, as an old timer, Max, I can testify that the change in the quality of the working groups and the ability for the SASB researchers to get a critical mass of experts and companies has really been dramatic. You know, Jeff, you've been around long enough to know that, uh, you know, three, four years ago, it was hard to get companies and organizations attention. And clearly the seriousness with which these topics are taken these days allows us to very quickly get to relevant and impactful feedback from players. And so this is a, Good example of how uh, how this can accelerate it. Um, I guess a couple of thoughts on this, uh, Max. Um, you know, this for for the stage we're at, it almost this seems to have been moving pretty quickly. Uh, it's a fairly concentrated industry, so I, it would seem as though we we should be able to make good progress. Um, but we talked a lot about uh, you know what isn't working, I guess. Uh, there are some other industry standards. Is it likely that there's just some clear things we can coalesce around? Or is, I, I guess the air quality may still be a struggle, but it, um, anyway, your thoughts on kind of, I don't want to go to the last chapter of the book, but likely outcomes, I guess. Yeah. 
Um, I, I'd say from you know a high level without digging too deeply into it, there, there are some things that are very simple, quick fixes. Um, one thing we highlighted was the you know EEDI metric. It's just not really used anymore as an indicator for emissions efficiency. Uh, the industry overall has trans uh, sort of moved to these um, average efficiency ratios and and other metrics that uh, you know International Maritime Organization is is prioritizing and putting out there as sort of the, the main metric. So that's a very quick fix. And then um, you know the, there are a few other things that are just language tweaks. The renewable energy component that yeah. nobody reporting on just changing that or having some wording around transition fuels um may, you know the, it, there are things that, that are fairly straightforward and others like adding a qualitative dis, you know discussion component to that yeah. air quality metric might it's like somebody you know you made a mention about us you know maybe doing some kind of density or metric around that all those these efficiency ratios kind of create that in and of themselves right yeah, they do. They do. Uh, and another thing that we mentioned was that scope to emissions um, metric. We're, we're actually seeing that pretty frequently in, in that disclosure analysis when I was going through and looking, all, at, looking at uh, all company disclosures. A lot of companies were actually adding it as an additional line item yeah. already. So, so there are a lot of companies that are already reporting on these things. And uh, yeah, I don't think that's unique to marine transportation. My suspicion is that uh, we'll have to broaden those metrics uh, at some point ourselves. but. Uh, well, great. Hopefully, uh, hopefully this is one where we can uh, become more relevant, globalize our metrics, and uh, you know be able to kick into gear relatively quickly. Um, it does raise one issue that, and this is the whole issue of you know we have a lot of customers and companies committing to zero net zero. Yeah. Uh, although, frankly, I'm a bit puzzled how you create a path with a huge you know, uh, energy consuming ship to truly become zero in the future. And so uh, I'm sure this is work the ISSB will be doing in the years to come. But, uh, you know, the credible path to that is certainly a big issue in this industry these days. And, uh, you know, whether it's offsets or truly finding fuels that don't have an impact uh, will be a big challenge for such a large, heavy transportation environment. So. Yeah, just future projects, I guess. Work security, Max. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Verity. Hi, Max. I was hoping you could go back to that slide where you talk about disclosure analysis findings for greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, yeah. And um, this is where you've got gross global scope one emissions um, in the top row. And then um, the the um, disclosure analysis found that 71% of companies disclosing uh, to this topic, um, I think it's 63 on my deck, that helps. There it is. Yeah. Uh, so 71% of companies are uh, disclosing in alignment with this metric um, for gross global scope one emissions. But 29% of disclosures are, are modifying this metric. Um, and this kind of stands out to me because I, I think the, the red box around the lower uh, line items is, is, is well explained. You discuss how um, renewable fuels are not widely available and so that it's not really, um, um, they're not widely used by the industry. So it's, it's typically omitted. And then you explain the EEDI um, issue being for new vessels rather than vessels in the fleet, active in the fleet. But this one, I, I wonder if you can provide a little more color on what kind of modifications are happening to uh, plain old scope one emissions? Yeah, so I, it's a really good question. And it, it, it goes back um, a few slides. So if we could go back to the, the greenhouse gas emissions slide uh, in the working group, a couple more. Yeah, uh, this one. So, so that last bullet, the clearly defining the methodology for emissions, it's it's a big discussion topic right now in the industry. There are you know multiple sort of different methodologies uh, that will drastically change that number uh, depending on which you choose. So, there's a well to wake. A lot of companies and uh, international maritime organization is sort of pushing this as as something to to focus on. Uh, takes you know all emissions from the time you know comes 
the fuel comes out of the well to the time it's burned in the ship. And then other companies will just look at a you know, tank to wake. So the fuel in the tank being burned, um, that's sort of part of the emissions you know, overall process. So th that was the major, um, I guess, modification or, or sort of disclosure. Uh, it's, it's a relevant topic right now, and a lot of people are sort of going back and forth on which to use. And that is, I would say, what is largely driving that high modification number. Uh, it's a yeah, it's a really good question. It's coming up pretty frequently. Well, I'd have to look into this a little bit more, but it, is this a little bit of a convergence of scope three into scope one, where there's sort of the upstream emissions being included in the scope one number? Am I reading that yeah. actually right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that is that is part of this, exactly. So um, it, it does sort of include some of that scope three number to the scope one uh and it's it's part of the debate currently over over sort of what is the best practice and how how do you clearly define um the, that overall emissions profile and uh it, it's actually a really interesting discussion because um when, when looking at some of the transition fuels for example the hydrocarbon fuels from a tank to weight perspective they look really 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 good they burn very cleanly but if you look further up upstream, they actually are very uh, emissions sort of intensive to, to produce. And that is one reason why, you know, they're sort of including this upstream element in the scope one discussion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. And I um, want to add my thanks to the members of the working group and especially the standards advisory group who, who kicked this off and highlighted this issue. It's great to know that 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 um, advisory group is is really fulfilling its purpose and and living the dream for us. So, I want to add my thanks. Thanks to you, Max. Thank you. Yep, Max. Um, just uh, on on this point about the the modifications, um, and that doesn't have to be specific to the scope one modifications, but. Any sense on, um, on how companies were explaining this, or like any of the modifications when they um, when they were modifying or omitting? Was there was there context given, or was it often just a, a different number? Or, yeah, you know? it, was, it was a little bit of both, but but usually companies were including some sort of uh, you know a, a appendix table. They would have the primary table with their disclosures and would footnote you know the the scope one emissions number. And then down in that table, they would explain, you know, in this for this figure, we've used a tank to wake uh, emissions methodology to calculate blah blah blah. Um, there, there were a few that that would make modifications and not go into to much detail, um, but I'd say overall, you know, they would typically have a separate table broken out where they were walking through their rationale and process for modifying mm -hmm. the, the processes. Yeah, so I think. Curious as this uh, as this work goes forward, and, and you know, with maybe with, with respect to like well to wake, um, you know, just gathering some of the evidence on that on the and talking to the companies that are doing that modification and asking for um, more context on on why that is. I mean, is it you know, it, perhaps it's that if we we do a more complete scope one, then then uh, we don't need to do a a very complicated scope three or just guide what goes into that. Uh, yep, I, I'd just be curious what some of the the rationale was from the the, the preparer, the reporter side. Um, For sure. And, you know, of course, understanding from the the investor community what happens to be the most uh, useful kind of um, measure there. Yeah, and, and we, we've heard a little bit of input from various working group members who are also, you know, major industry participants, but I think there's definitely a lot more work we could do there to really sort of dig into exactly why people are modifying those. So, yeah, a lot of work to do. Yeah, absolutely. And then on the on the scope two, um, you know, that's that's one thing where, uh, you know, if, if a lot of companies are adding scope two in addition to the total energy consumed, then uh, I think that would be, uh, you know, it's one thing if they're substituting it. It's another thing if it's just an additional disclosure and and maybe understanding where where that uh, is coming from. It might be you know, trying to align with TCFD, for example. And so they're just putting it out there as part of that. Uh, but that, that also is kind of helpful, um, you know, especially if they think that there's something that would be preferable there um, in, you know, like this rather than energy, for example, um, you know, total energy used, that would be, 
helpful. And I see Verity's come back on, so maybe from an investor perspective, she's going to enlighten me uh, on, 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 oh, she's not. So uh, <laughs> what she does all the time on many things, so so no, no problem on this particular thing. But uh, um, that would just be part of, I think, where I see some uh, of the questions that are likely to come up uh, as we move forward in understanding this. Verity, um, you're back. I did have another question about the intensity metric here, and just wondering, um, these can be very useful, these can also be very industry specific, but um, do you have any leanings or did we learn anything from the working group in terms of, you know, getting a solid greenhouse gas emission scope one value and then perhaps using an activity metric for the normalization um, or to, to um, normalize between companies in this kind of intensity? Yeah, so uh, currently the activity metrics do capture some of that. And if you do the math on the scope one emissions number and the, the sort of metrics we have in the activity metrics, you can get a sense of that. Um, I, so, so it does exist today, effectively, but, but a lot of companies are actually choosing to add it. Um, companies, you know, uh, the COVID process is a, the COVID timeline is a pretty interesting one where, um, you know, just overall shipping went significantly down and it reduces that scope one emissions number and makes it look really good but in reality it's because they're shipping less um, and then you also have you know disparity between companies with just size of the fleet some companies have significantly more ships but they actually may be more emissions efficient than you know smaller companies with less ships um, and so people were just adding that, that intensity metric is actually a very important thing to sort of capture that overall emissions efficiency but to your point uh, if you do dig into the activity metrics, you can find it. I did not include it in uh, this presentation, but those activity metrics had um, fairly low overall disclosure. There were a good number of companies that were emitting them, which sort of makes that overall uh, intensity, um, you know, you, you can't really do the math on it and get a sense as to the emissions efficiency uh, of the companies. So that is a complicating factor. but. Uh, if they do provide it, you can do the math. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a it's a great question, Verity. And um, I, the way I think about this too is if there's if there's something in a particular intensity me metric that that as a denominator would be particularly important, you know, or if it's some other calculation of a numerator that's not something that we're already disclosing. If there's some, you know, uh, just to understand where the the benefit would be from adding something like that versus looking to improve just the numerator and denominator information more, more broadly, more completely. Uh, I, I would note um, my, my students have been doing analyses of companies uh, like for their for end of semester reports. And and from what I read in, in their reports, a lot of companies with respect to the COVID uh, issue actually did put contact quite a bit of like pretty fair context around their their decreased um, 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 you know, emissions, yes, but also more broadly than that, anything that looked like it might be an improvement that might have been just due to a, a dip in, in business. There, was pretty, there, there appeared to be a lot of context that was given to that. So I think that's, uh, you know, that's that's helpful. And it's something that, you know, it's unlikely that a particular metric is going to be the, the silver bullet to always capture. Yeah. You, you are somewhat at the mercy of the company, though. You know, if they choose not to disclose the activity metrics, but do disclose the scope one, then that's all you really see. And, um, yeah. Voluntary standards where we're like this is this is all on the companies to 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 make sure that the information is available for for the, the investors. Yeah. A lot of discussion. Um, it's great. Great stuff. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, all the board members who had questions or, or comments had an opportunity to to make them. Sounds like maybe. Uh, there, Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Yeah, uh, actually, thank you so much, uh, Max. I was wondering again, uh, in 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 line with my with my previous question, uh, should we expect that this sort of collaboration with the industry would become uh, a good practice in uh, you know under the auspices of the I know, I know it's hard to ask you about the ISSB, but, but just curious to say what were, you know, what were the benefits of, uh, of this, uh, you know, 
form of collaboration as uh, as compared to how we otherwise uh, develop our standards. Uh, so just uh, just a thought. Yeah, it was um, the the overall pro overall process was incredibly helpful, uh, especially identifying some of these very specific industry issues that are you know topical and prevalent at a certain time. So that that well to wake tank to wake methodology uh, was not something I'd ever heard of. And so having working group members who are participants in the industry walk me through it was, uh, and, and us, the team generally through it, was very, very helpful. So can't speak to the ISSB, uh, not particularly sure, but I personally found it to be very helpful. And Max, Jeff, I'm sorry I jump in because um, I know Max did join us after we were starting to kind of wrap up with our working with the working group. Um, did want to ditto, like you know, and also going back to Bob's comment earlier, this was a very, I think for us, a tremendously um, helpful and productive working group. Began with a, several of our sector advisory group members and really bringing together a collection of different um, stakeholders from the marine transportation industry. And I think. One thing that was extremely helpful too was the the members really taking the time to understand, you know, our conceptual framework, our process as well, on how how we go about standard setting and using that lens um, through our you know kind of two way discussions on how it applies. So that that was tremendous and absolutely to to Bob's comment um, or in question earlier, it's that this would be a model you know, we would be interested in exploring with others, you know, whether specific industry or on specific issues. Um, and it was great to just have the room share their voices. Um, as far as going forward with the ISSB, I think from our end, we we still believe this, you know, market participation and engagement with market stakeholders. We would still like this to be a big part of the standard setting process. We see tremendous value um, to it in guiding things forward. So um, certainly a direction we would like to continue and, and hope we can do so in the future. Thanks, Lynn. Um, well, while, while I have you here, um, you know, we might, uh, unless there were other comments or questions from the board, which definitely don't want to short uh, cut any of that, um, short circuit that. But uh, but if not, uh, we could uh, maybe just take a moment to, to kind of gather the, the thoughts and feedback that we've heard so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think appreciate all the board members, you know, insightful questions and discussions. A few main points I wanted to to highlight, you know, before all, all, we all head into potentially a, a vote on this is I'm going back to to Bob starting out. I think, you know, we discussed a bit around this working group model. I mean, it was very informative for the staff and again, echoing is a approach that we, we would like to consider can go forward in the future. Um, Kurt brought up a couple good points around the different approaches. I think one thing I went, wanted to add to is, um, you know, Max shared in the beginning of the presentation, a lot of different international efforts with industry groups, associations, looking at these issues. Uh, always in our standard setting approach, we aim for cost effectiveness and alignment also with industry practices. Um, we recognize some of these issues are ones that um, potentially, you know, the International Maritime Association Situation or is looking to maybe reach a an approach, a new decision in the coming year as well. Um, so certainly um, will be something we'll continue to monitor and, and make sure we align in in these approaches. And then Verity and, and you know Jeff, you both brought up some really great points around you know the scope uh, of GHG disclosures. You know, scope one, two, three. You know, we are seeing, as Max discussed, this industry starting to report more beyond just their scope one emissions. Um, equally on the intensity metrics, um, our approach up to date in the SASB standards has usually been around the absolute um, metrics. So, you know, as Jeff noted, through the combination of using an accounting metric as well as a cat activity metric, you can get to that calculation. But equally, we're observing intensity metrics is a direct uh, measurement that some investors, you know, companies are interested in and an area we would certainly um, be interested to explore more as we progress in this project on, you know, what's approach. But around both of those, the, the scope discussion on PHG emissions around intensity, I think this also goes broader than this project, um, this industry, um, in our overall climate um, approach. So I'm um, certainly welcome, you know, any market feedback, anyone listening on this from, from their industries as well. Um, so, so yeah, the kind of summarizes what, what I heard from the discussions from the board in addition, you know, of course, to what Max shared and hopefully um, can 
open it up to a vote on, on next steps. Great, thank you, Lynn. Um, so, so with that, I can invite the, the board to, to rejoin. nine, 10, and everyone's there. All right, um, so this is about the size that I prefer to see you all. Um, so go ahead and uh, ask if there is a, a motion to approve a standard setting project for the transportation, marine transportation uh, industry um, as proposed by uh, the staff. I'll so move. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. A second. I can second. I see a, I see a hand. So, uh, Mark, thank you. Yeah. I'll give you credit. Yeah. Oh, it's Suzanne. <laughs> right thank you. No, it's uh, fine. So, yeah, with, with that, uh, all those in favor? So many. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, we will say that that is also then approved. So uh, thank you to the board for, for that and for the comments today. And thanks to, to uh, Max at, for being here and, and walking us through all that and the work that he's doing that. We look forward to seeing that project move forward. Um, and, uh, and Lynn, thanks for, for your summary there. So uh, we will we'll now go ahead and, and move on to, to raw materials sourcing uh, and apparel. And for that, we welcome back Taylor, um, uh, hopefully for a, a less go-to webinar written uh, challenge, but <laughs> it seems like the software is working better now. So uh, with that, welcome back Taylor. Um, and uh, I think we'll, uh, we'll, Mark and I uh, will we'll leave you to it. Excellent. Um, all right, I will go ahead and dive in then. Uh, I will pro be providing a standard setting update on our project for raw material sourcing in apparel. And today we're going to be focusing on the comments we received during the recent public comment period. I'm going to review those letters. And then I'd like to discuss possible next steps with the board and gain the board's input on those. So as a reminder, the board initiated this project based off of market input and internal staff review, which suggested that two metrics in the raw materials sourcing disclosure topic provided insufficient guidance that may be resulting in inconsistent calculations and non-comparable disclosures. Um, and just to note, we are talking about the apparel, accessories, and footwear industry. And then the project objective is to revise, clarify, and consider improvements to the two underlying metrics of the raw material sourcing disclosure topic. Running through the project timeline, we initiated the project in February 2020, had a consultation period for most of 2020, began exposure draft development at the beginning of this year, and then held our 90-day public comment period from June 2nd to September 3rd. And since then, we've been analyzing public comments and are interested in gaining the board's perspective on next steps today. I'm gonna take a moment here to walk through the current metrics, which can be found in the codified version, which are, are in black here at the top, and then also the proposed metrics at the bottom in red. So the codified standard has a qualitative metric, which is the description of environmental and social risks associated with sourcing priority raw materials. What we have proposed in the exposure draft is asking entities to list their priority raw materials. And then for each priority raw material provide the environmental and or social factor most likely to threaten sourcing, discussion on the business risks and or opportunities associated with social and or environmental factors, and then management strategy for addressing business risks and opportunities. The quantitative metric that is currently in the codified standard is the percentage of raw materials third party certified to an environmental or social sustainability standard by standard. And then what we have proposed for the quantitative metric in the exposure draft is asking entities to disclose the amount of priority raw materials purchased by material, 
and the amount of each priority raw material that is third-party certified to a social and or environmental standard by standard. So just a, a high level view of where we came from with the metrics and what was produced in the exposure draft. I'm gonna quickly just discuss the key sections of the basis for conclusions. So the, the basis contains the board's rationale for the proposed changes. We included rationale for aligning the definition of priority raw materials with existing industry standards. Um, rationale for expanding disclosure on the qualitative metric, which I just kind of talked through at a high level. And then um, disclosure for adjustments to the quantitative metric in which we added a submetric asking for total amount of priority raw materials purchased. And we also made a change to ask for the amount of certified priority raw materials purchased instead of a percentage in finished products. And then we also provided rationale uh, for the proposed change asking entities to disclose uh, why they selected specific third-party standards or certifications. And then um, also a note on suggesting tabular reporting format for disclosure. So just kind of a key takeaway here is that this is a very technical standard setting project and um, we're going to go even into more technical details in the next section. Um, but starting with the public comment period, providing a high level overview here, uh, we held the public comment period from the beginning of June to the beginning of September, and we received 13 public comment letters, two from companies, three from investors, and eight from interested parties, which were largely made up of subject matter experts uh, consultants and some NGOs. Next, in the basis for conclusion, we posed uh, six questions for respondents. Here I have four questions listed and these are all on the same slide because they are the questions where we received a large amount of market support for the proposed changes and staff is not recommending further revisions. Uh, there are two things I'll note here. One is in question three. We did receive comments from two respondents that raised concerns over the guidance's applicability for accessories and footwear. And the reasoning there is that there is a higher degree of estimation required in compiling disclosures and calculations on accessories and footwear. So that's kind of, I believe, why those respondents raised that issue. However, we believe that those concerns are largely addressed by our standards application guidance, which provides guidance um, on estimates and how estimates should be handled in disclosures. And then the second note I will point out here is on question five, we asked the market whether they agreed with the board's conclusion to not expand the scope of the raw material sourcing disclosure topic to include packaging. And we did receive some split responses on that, but ultimately, we didn't receive any new information that pointed to other solutions or input that would imply additional necessary changes. So today I'm hoping to spend most of our time talking through some input we received on two questions that we believe warrant further board discussion. Um, and we'll go into more detail on each of these questions in the next sections, but um, at a high level, we asked a question on whether the market agreed with the board's rationale to structure metrics by priority raw material versus another component like sourcing region or social or environmental factor. And overall, we received very supportive comments of the approach. However, roughly half of the respondents cited sourcing country or region as another important element of disclosure. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then the other issue is around how the standards provide guidance to entities in their selection of credible third-party certifications and standards. 
Um, and ultimately, what we heard from the market was acknowledgement of the difficulty in managing some of the nuance here. Uh, we did gain a lot of supportive comments. However, there were a number of more detailed recommendations on things we could further consider to enhance the guidance we provide. So let's start with this first issue. And here we're talking about the opportunity to expand guidance on sourcing region and country. And to recap what we heard from stakeholders, from most investors, we heard that information related to sourcing region and country is important and would enhance completeness. This input contradicted what we heard from some companies um, who said that it is not always cost effective to disclose information and this could require a high degree of estimation, especially for companies that are sourcing finished goods and are not vertically integrated across their supply chain. And then what we heard from experts is that, kind of similar to what we heard from investors, that this information is important to understanding the sourcing risks and that companies have the data and could disclose it without too much additional work. So we can see here that we have some conflicting input. And so that's kind of what we need to consider in next steps. So what staff has um, kind of thought of uh, as possible next steps is to perform some disclosure analysis to better understand the feasibility of disclosure on the issue and looking into what is produced now and using that disclosure analysis to develop some mock disclosures and perhaps um, a good, better, best mock-up that we could then use in market consultations with companies and investors to determine if there's some sort of middle ground we can find between what's decision useful for investors and what is cost-effective for companies to disclose. So we'll pause here and have a quick discussion with the board um, and then we'll move on to the next issue. But for this portion of the discussion, we're interested in understanding the board's views on these possible next steps and whether there's specific information that staff can pursue to support the board's decision making. Thank you, Taylor. Um, you pulled off flawlessly with uh, no breaks in audio or video. So well well done there. Uh, you know, you never really know if the world can hear you when you're speaking, you just kind of assume that they can, but uh, but you know, we could, so thank you. Um, let's go ahead and, uh, and go with Bob. Good, thank you, Jeff. So Taylor, thanks. Just a, a couple of comments. I've had some prior experience in dealing with uh, public comment letters and I think we've done this, but generally my experience has been you you consider the, the quantity of what you got back, what you've done. Uh, you consider the quality, how much time and effort went into the to the points and, and also the source. You know, did it come from a credible source? Did it come from a single individual with uh, with not a lot of experience? Or, for example, does it come from an industry association where it's representing uh, many, many companies? And then the other thing I like to think about is so what is the benefit to the final product? Does the does the comment really if we implement it and I, I will suggest you do a little bit more work does it make the product or the standard you know better and then what are what are any unintended consequences of the decision we make so that's an overall comment also I want to comment is 100 percent of everybody will never be 100 percent satisfied so we're always going to have some um, divergent views. And remember, there's no legal requirement yet to our standards. Uh, they're voluntary. So the point I'm making is I support you doing a little bit more work. But I believe that the board itself is a source of expertise. When you look at the backgrounds of everyone, the experiences they have, the, the industries, then I think at some point, you know, we're going to have to put the hammer down and say yes or no to these two things. Is there a geographic table that would be beneficial? And I don't always understand it's not cost effective to do something. I think the answer is it would cost too much to do it and we don't want to do it. So, so can the board be that source of ultimate final expertise? Um, 
you know, and use our judgment with that. And then, you know, the, the second point um, a, as well with respect to, um, you know, the, the, the second item. So there's the, the geographic point and then there's, um, I'm blanking on the other one. You know, can, can we just, you know, think about jointly as a board, what, what do we think after you do this additional research? But I think at some point we're just going to have to, you know, decide to come up with these are more helpful than less helpful. And therefore, that's our answer. There's quite a bit there. So Taylor, you took it all in, I guess. I'm not, you know. I mean, I, I completely agree with you. It's it's always, I mean, Jeff, I feel like we say this in every meeting, but we are in the business of trade-offs and, and ultimately we are, you know, that's probably why standards don't exist yet is because this is really challenging work. Um, so I, I completely agree with you and ultimately all we can do is do as much research as we possibly can and get informed views and ultimately it's up to the standards board to make the decision on um, what beneficial revisions would be. Yeah, I have an additional comment on this. I may come back to it in a little bit, but uh, uh, Stephanie, you've been, you've been patiently waiting. Great, thank you. Um, great job, Taylor. And I completely agree on doing more analysis on existing disclosures and providing at least a straw man for people to react to. Um, but I would lean in definitely on more market consultations, especially given the fact that we received letters from just two companies and three investors. Um, and I believe the comments we received were from larger companies. So I do have you know, some concerns to make sure that we are reaching out to smaller companies, companies that purchase finished goods, as you pointed out, um, and perhaps in the mock disclosures, considering, you know, something along the lines of estimates or allowing, um, you know, companies to provide more qualitative disclosure, which I know we always encourage people to supplement with, but mm -hmm. potentially describing their methodology if they aren't able to provide an exact number or, you know, thinking about ranges or broader regions, just to allow a little bit more along the spectrum of feasibility and cost effectiveness. Definitely, thank you, Stephanie. Kurt, I think you edged out Dan for, for next up. Yeah, it was a neck and neck finish, but I think I squeezed you in, Dan. Um, I just wanted to uh, back up and, and support what Stephanie said. Um, you know, we always face this issue of how much detail, how much not. Um, but increasingly, it seems like the market's momentum is such that more and more companies are responding more and more and having more ability to report. So, Taylor, my advice on this, uh, just to take Stephanie's comments one step farther. There's, I don't think there's anything wrong with asking for tabular breakdowns, perhaps by geography for critical elements, and companies that don't have that data cannot fill that part out or can use a narrative. So, um, you know, whereas I think uh, several years ago, as we were swimming upstream on this focus with corporations, it made sense to be very targeted and narrow I think now allowing a template for more detail and allowing companies to fill in what they can is not a bad way at all to do it. And those that have the detail can provide it. Those that don't will more likely be driven to a narrative. And so I think uh, you know your, this, your plan to develop a potential approach and see what it looks like, I think will help normalize it and maybe take some of the fear out of it since these are voluntary standards, um, then I would err towards the side of building a template for the future or a structure that will allow more robust reporting and relevant reporting because some of our discussions earlier when you'd mentioned, you know, if you say, okay, the U.S., we, got, we, we source cotton in the U.S., but it may make a heck of a difference what section of the U.S. or what area of China this sourcing is. In some areas, water is a significant risk. In other areas, it's not. So it's hard to use a very broad brush approach for areas that are so geographic specific. So anyway, I do think building the capability to accept more data and letting companies grow into that is a prudent approach. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thanks, Kurt. Dan. Yeah, maybe I should have clicked a little faster because I, I think I generally agree with what 
Kurt said. I, I guess it, 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 as I understand what, what you're saying here, Taylor, and I guess looking at slide 83 in particular, there, there seems to be general agreement, and it certainly makes logical sense, that uh, on geographic sourcing information is important in understanding the risks around sourcing. The dispute or the problem is about how available that information is and how, ex or how expensive it would be for companies to, to get it. On, on that, there, there does seem to be a factual dispute. The, the companies say we don't have it and it's expensive and whoever the, the subject matter experts are seem to think that the information is available. Mm -hmm. I, I think you do have to, it's, it's, it's hard for us or me at least as a board member to resolve that without perhaps you, you know you doing more research or getting more input to have a little bit better understanding of who's right and who's wrong on on that issue. But but mm -hmm. sort of stepping beyond that, perhaps the answer is going to end up being asking companies to estimate and then explain how they made the estimate in order to get you know a sense of what the credibility of the estimate is if they don't have the information available correctly. Yes, that's definitely a, a possible approach we could consider because um, I think that from some of the companies we've heard from in terms of, of those that have to purchase finished goods, there is such a high degree of estimation from what I understand that they worry that the usefulness of the data is diminished because there is such a high degree of estimation involved. Um, you know, they'd, have, they'd have to rely on their sources, or their suppliers to give them the information, I, I guess in order for them to make the disclosure. I mean, just, uh, and, and I know Mark jumped in here, but you know, the way I think about this a little bit is, is where are the risks and opportunities related to sourcing? And are they fundamentally different for companies that are sourcing finished goods versus ones that are uh, kind of controlling more of the, the value chain? So that's one part that, that I'd want to understand a little bit, a little bit better. Um, um, it's not just a question necessarily of comparabilities. Com like comparability is going to be a question if, if everybody kind of faces the same risks, then it's just a matter of getting the measure. Um, but if a different business model creates different risks and opportunities, then I'd want to think about how that actually plays out into what we're asking at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, Mark? Um, so I just wanted to weigh in here on, on this. This is very common in standard setting, actually, right? To, to, to get feedback from preparers saying it's very, very costly or a lot of estimates are going involved and, and investors to say this is very important information. So that's not unusual. I do agree that there's probably not. And so at some point, I think we're going to have to make a call. Um, we're not going to get, you know, we're not going to get um, complete alignment uh, on one way or the other on that. There's just going to be potentially a disagreement. But I think what could help is is a little bit more like we, we were saying a straw man and then potentially one venue that i've seen work well in the past is is bringing together the parties to look at the straw man together in the same meeting and and so that each side cannot talk past each other and you actually hear um the comments that are made by both sides and um you know invite a, a subset of board members to hear it as well and and um those kinds of conversations often help um help understand where where you might be able to maximize the cost benefit equation um but at some point i think we're just going to have to make a call mm -hmm. yeah great idea there mark thanks mark um very did you have a, a direct follow-up on marks because i have one other comment on that okay so um just my thought on that um uh that same a line of, of reasoning was and this was brought out a bit in the in the memo to the board you really like how do we think about what the the trade-off might be or, or the or the conflicting things that we hear back and i don't really think of the the feedback that we're getting is necessarily in conflict if if we're hearing that it could be useful for decision making and we hear that it is going to be costly to um to to produce the information then that's not a conflict that's you know it is, it is it's a trade-off but it's not necessarily a conflict and so uh, the, you know, on the question of what would be helpful, like for the staff to learn, uh, I think in in doing additional engagement on this, would be, you know, I think 
what do companies and investors say about the decision usefulness and uh, and subject matter experts in and in particular if you ask a, a like a a company uh, would this information be useful to you in managing the company and managing your sourcing risks like do do you consider region how does that play into your your actual decision making and completely get that you know it might be that they like, we never think about it. I, I find that sort of surprising, but like maybe that's what they say. Uh, they may say that like we do think about it, but the way in which we make those decisions doesn't lend itself to aggregating that information in a way that could be reported out, or at least it would be costly to shift the system to do that. And that like that's that is a, a an important thing to understand. But there's a there's a nuance there in terms of um, where where the the cost is coming from, like. Um, and in terms of gathering the information, reporting it out, and also maybe something to learn in terms of um, usefulness, both from the perspective of companies and managing, as well as uh, investors from making decisions related to the company. Completely agree with you there, Jeff. Um, I think from a staff perspective, we need more information on what investors would find useful um you know whether it's quantitative quantitative numbers on purchasing amounts from specific countries or if it's you know general regional information that that is something we need to understand more before being able to make any serious decisions or recommendations yeah to me it seems very different if it's uh if it's identifying red flags versus trying to quantify the extent of risk or something like that that seems like it would lend itself to different types of information mm -hmm. but i see but like we have a, almost a full slate of our our investor perspective board members so uh so I'm, they're welcome to comment but verity i um i know you've been waiting to make it to make a comment well, it turns out you, you said a lot of what I wanted to say, so I guess it was directly in response to Mark's um, comments, but uh, you, you said it much more eloquently. The, the piece I'll add is, um, you know, if, if you're looking for what evidence or what, what examples that, that show investors are going to find this information useful, you could think of something like an investment policy statement. I think I shared that with you, Taylor, where um, CalSTRS uh, includes some geopolitical um, issues uh, that are risk factors that we uh, consider in any investment decision. And they're, they're, they overlap and they're interspersed with issues about climate and human rights. And so my next comment is to say that when you do get some examples of how investors would use this information if provided, that you don't get stuck or that we don't get stuck on it being only an environmental or only a social issue, that that doesn't shut it down because it doesn't map back to general issue categories or some other technical reason that that either could be useful and, and probably there it's going to be more than one general issue category in terms of a reason or um, a manifestation of this usefulness. So that's it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Verity. That, that's very helpful, Verity. I, mean, I definitely think we can over over parse the world into like small little buckets. Um, the accountant in me is like naturally inclined to do so, but I also recognize that that everything is interrelated. In some ways, I think about this is that the reason that we think about E, S, and G is that we're more likely to hit the issues that matter because we'll come at it from different angles where there's probably a common element among, among different parts. And if we only thought of it one way, we might not capture all the angles. So it kind of speaks to the completeness of what we're trying to do. So at some point. Um, Lloyd. Yeah, just a quick comment as I uh, reflect on this. I, I think First of all, I um, strongly agree with what Lynn said about a little more feedback. I think participation's a little limited, and I think um, just hearing some additional voices might clarify matters. I think we do need to make a distinction, and disclosure is not always data. Disclosure can be more valuable for an investor if it's explaining the underlying business rationale. For example, you know, Phil Knight, when he founded Nike, his master's thesis was I can put production in Asia because it's cheaper. And then I can take the extra margin and I can reinvest that in marketing and win market share. So he told you his logic and that disclosure of that logic is probably as valuable in some cases as the raw data that we'd be looking for. So I think we live in a complex world. Globalization is changing a lot of things. 
the ability to arbitrage costs across national borders being diminished a little bit and trade policies getting a lot thornier. So management teams need to have a take and they need to tell investors what it is. And you know, from my own personal experience, it's very, very uneven. So I think going beyond data, but just asking management teams about the rationale may be a fruitful path. Mm-hmm. Great, Thank, thanks Lloyd. Um, a lot, of, a lot of interesting discussion. I know we still have one more point that you wanted to, to get to, Taylor, so um, let you go Yes, and this is um, a bit of a technical one. So um, the second issue that I want to discuss with the board is regarding our proposed guidance uh, to help entities identify and select credible certifications and standards. So our goal with the proposed changes is to help companies facilitate the identification of those credible certifications and standards uh, that ultimately contribute to their management of social and environmental factors that are likely to threaten their supply of priority raw materials. So that's what we are trying to do with the revisions. And in the basis for conclusions, we outlined two possible approaches The first approach is um, one that consists of the standard listing a specific set of certifications and standards that companies could use in their sourcing strategy. And the pros of this approach is that it guides companies to a clear list of third party certifications and standards and could improve comparability. But in terms of disadvantages, it requires ongoing maintenance of the list and may suggest that the standards board has a preference or that we have a preference for specific certifications and standards, which is not our intent. And then the second approach that we outlined in the basis was a more principles oriented approach in that the standard would identify a set of principles that companies could use to identify credible certifications and standards. And the pros of this approach is that it would probably require less maintenance and provide more objective guidance. However, during the consultation phase, we didn't identify industry or stakeholder consensus on a common set of principles and that a principles-based approach could result in less comparable disclosures. So this is what we ended up proposing in the exposure draft. We maintained a list of possible standards and certifications. So you'll see here that we note that uh, the standards could include, but are not limited to the ones that are referenced here on the left-hand part of the slide. And then we also added a technical protocol that asks entities to disclose why it has chosen specific third-party certifications and standards, and then how those certified materials contribute to managing its business risks and opportunities and any quantitative targets. So ultimately what we asked for market input on was input on those two approaches and whether respondents had a preference between the two and if so, why? And if they preferred the principles-based approach, what principles they would consider when evaluating the credibility of a third-party certification and standards. And as I mentioned at the top, we heard from respondents that they acknowledged and understood kind of the difficulties in both approaches. And there was support for what we proposed in the exposure draft. In fact, two respondents uh, just uh, endorsed the proposed changes as is. However, we also received a number of more detailed recommendations that we could consider to enhance the guidance. So. Uh, I've listed a few here and won't go into all of them, but basically they consist of added disclosure on things like the objective or the scope or the level of rigor of standards and certifications selected. So what we are faced with here is a potential opportunity to further look into some of these recommendations uh, and determine if they could further enhance the guidance we provide. 
And here we are interested in gaining the board's perspective on what our possible next steps might be around the issue. And likewise, if there's specific information that we could pursue to further support the board's decision making on this. Thanks, Taylor. Um, let's see if there are any uh, comments or questions from, from the board. Um, my, my own view um, on, on this is, um, well, one thing is with the, the question of why was uh, a, a specific certification or standard chosen, um, I think that that might be the, the least, I mean, like in a sense, it's like quite helpful um, especially when you think about it on its own. But when you think about reporting in perpetuity, um, I, I wonder the extent to which that would be a meaningful part of the full disclosure that a company was providing on this topic, because the why did they choose? Well, you know, at some point, like if a company has been using it, the same one for, for five years, the people in charge of the reporting may not have been involved with the why, and they're probably just going to carry over the the reasoning year to year anyway. Um, but the, the second and third parts of that are probably um, more, more important because, you know, to the extent that that is still relevant to the way that the, the, the business is being managed, then that can be a helpful context that could be updated from, from year to year. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And um, apologies for that, like not being the specific point that you were hoping to get feedback on, but you know, you, you, you get my view with, without respect yeah. to the way that's best. I think the challenge here is that there are so many standards and certifications out there and they change. Um, so it's challenging, like I said, to keep up that list. But at the same time, I think it's challenging for investors to keep up with the credibility of all those various standards and certifications. And so what we're trying to do is to bridge that gap of providing company rationale and disclosure on if there's a specific reason why they are choosing uh, one certification over another. Yeah, I think the the you know the the ongoing discussion of of how like how any certifications or standards are are being used to kind of manage the business. I mean, to me, that seems like maybe the the most helpful part of of all of this. And I get the the questions on both sides of give us flexibility, but also give us clarity. Um, and and I wonder if there's if there's um, you know like a regional difference there as well, because there are you know, sort of um, regional differences, generally speaking, with respect to the, you know the, a desire for clarity versus sort of you know more flexibility in reporting. So, um, just food for thought. Kurt. Uh, yeah, I, um, you know, on this one, since there isn't a clear, rigorous, you know, leading standard, I, I I'm hesitant for us to push this too hard. I just, you know, I'm just trying to think of other parallels we've had in other industries. And in some cases, there is a global standard or certification, but this this just feels like a preform narrative on the company's part. I don't see us trying to dig into the whys and trying to standardize this one. Uh, you know, Jeff's point's well taken. At some point, it becomes a historical relic. Um, so I just think maybe just leaving some space for you know, those areas of certification and investors can see whether these are significant or not. And as the winds change or the region becomes changing. So it just feels like this may be a bridge too far to try to standardize something that's that nebulous. And, uh, you know, I don't think it adds that much that it's worth us trying to uh, institutionalize or do much more detailed work on this. I think I'd just leave it to the company and, you know, let let the things settle out on that on their own rather than us trying to step out in front of the uh, the parade on this one. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kurt. Um, uh, so I know Verity's up next, and I'll just just to to remind us, I guess uh, I, I got us off probably to the wrong foot and sort of like just weighing in on like where what views I would like in the final standard. So. Uh, I think there are specific questions that would be most helpful to to the staff right now. So, uh, Verity is always very good at bringing us back on task. Um, uh, Verity, what do you got? 
Well, I was going to say, I, I really back what Kurt was saying. So from the investor view, I mean, I think a, a big part of this is um, th that both companies like to say that their um, their goods are certified to a certain standard because it's a shortcut for understanding that certain considerations have been factored in, certain environmental management, uh, social management social issue management and other kinds of considerations are built into the ending for certified product. Um, but I do think that investors have to do the work to figure out which of those standards are credible or meaningful and which are probably just more commercial marketing exercises. And I don't think SASB needs to be the arbiter of which ones are, are worthy or not. And to me, I, I don't like the idea of providing a list of certification standards because it, it does seem to imply that we're um, approving or considering some worthy of, of inclusion on the list or not, even if we do really clearly explain that they're there because companies are using them. Um, so I would steer away from the list view um, for that reason and, and for the other reasons you mentioned about them changing and you know, maybe they could become more rigorous or become less rigorous and, and then how useful is it? So those are my two cents. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Bernie. Yeah, um, I, I do think that there's there's more than one way in which we can you know, facilitate providing guidance to the marketplace as well. And we've certainly seen, for example, in some of the work with the Standards Advisory Group convening um, you know, preparers together to, to talk about what they use, best practices there, helping investors to understand what might be useful. So uh, not all the problems that we try to solve have to be solved through standards. Um, you know, so it just depends on whether it lends itself, a particular situation lends itself to a standard setting solution, um, which you know, often it does, but, but not always. Elizabeth? Yeah, I'm about to make the least impactful comment of the day and just say I agree entirely with what Verity just said, like usual. I usually agree with Verity, so wanted to um, state that for the record, too. That's helpful. We hand, hand Verity a, a proxy vote for, for us, you know. <laughs> Excellent. I was just so, going to provide a quick yeah. recap, unless anyone else has has um, additional comments. No, I think, uh, please. Jeff, let me let me know if, if this all sounds logical to you, but it sounds like the board is interested in pursuing some additional research and consultation to the opportunity to potentially expand guidance on sourcing region or country and investigating that, but is potentially more apprehensive to diving into more research and consultation around some of these detailed recommendations we got to um, enhance the guidance we provide on selecting credible certifications and standards. And then also a note, just cautioning our use of lists of uh, specific certifications and standards. Great. I, I think that's right. Um, uh, in, and in particular, it's maybe the having heard the feedback that we heard it's then i think informative on uh the extent to which a a list uh, and a list maybe with principles or not would be would be particularly helpful and so sort of revised board views it sounds like on on some of that compared to maybe where some board members sat going into the the um, release of the exposure draft so mm -hmm. Great. Well, we will continue to work with the board on the exposure draft and we'll most likely pursue additional research and consultations related to sourcing region. Um, and with that, I am going to go ahead and pass it off to our next presenter. Great. Thank you, Taylor. Really appreciate your work on this uh, and, uh, and, and walking us through all that today. Thank you. Right. Uh, Welcome, and also Will. So uh, you're both here uh, to walk us through some technical updates and uh, editorial corrections processes. So what uh, some of our thinking on this, I think Brian, you were gonna um, maybe tee up the discussion first. Yeah, perfect, Jeff. Uh, great to be back here on the virtual stage. Um, so I'm just gonna take a minute here um, to provide a little bit of context for the board around this project and particularly how it relates to the IFRS Foundation's announcement around the ISSB. 
Um, so I'll get to that in just a second, but really the, the thinking is that as I discussed at the outset of the meeting, it's, it's, it's extremely important for the board and the staff to push forward across our project portfolio and the range of standard setting activities that, that we have while we increasingly have an eye towards transitioning, either completing projects or transitioning them in the direction of the ISSB as appropriate. With that said, uh, this was one project or one item on the agenda where we took a, 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 a larger pivot than, um, than any other projects in terms of, of responding to or adjusting to our approach here due to the ISSB context. So I'll touch on that in just a second here. Um, but getting directly to the session objectives, what we want to accomplish here and what really Will is going to look to accomplish in leading this session is to help the board understand the need for technical updates and editorial corrections processes, really the why on why this matters and, and even how this fits in. And then also to uh, Will will review and discuss staff's recommendations for technical updates and the editorial corrections processes. So let's get back to the ISSB context on the next slide here. Uh, given the announcement last month on the formation of the ISSB, we did pivot the approach on this project specifically in light of the announcement. What we initially, what staff was initially planning on bringing forward to the board was more of a formal project proposal to seek the board's approval to initiate what was designed to be an annually recurring process around both technical updates and to address editorial corrections. So kind of a permanent or perpetual project on the agenda that would re reoccur on an annual cycle. Um, that would then take a significant investment in, in resources and, and time in order to get that process all designed and up and established um, in order to make sure it's effective and efficient, clear for the market, um, appropriate engagement with the standards board, appropriate compliance with due process and transparency and, and such. Um, given the ISSB announcement, we're now adjusting how we're thinking about this project going forward. However, with that said, this has been a known area that we've discussed uh, with the board, across staff, uh, for a couple of years now on, around the importance of having a technical updates process and editorial corrections, really part of the responsibility of being a, um, an effective standard setter. And we thought the timing around now was going to be the, the right time to really get that process up and running. Um, Will, had, Will and others on the team, including a number of board members, have invested some significant time into researching and analyzing, really evaluating what we think the most effective processes are for technical updates and editorial corrections. We continue to think that the, the, the thinking, the progress that we've made in this area thus far is still really important. It's really important for the board to be aware of, and it may even help inform um, ISSB thinking around kind of these maintenance processes, technical updates and corrections and such. So we wanted to have this session today to be really clear with where we are today and really bring forward the best thinking around the updates and corrections processes and really do it in a public forum uh, that, that like we're, we're in today. Uh, furthermore, um, we're, uh, we're also seeking to, um, to really take a view now um, in, you know, post the announcement from last month in how to, how to address or how to manage at least some of the known updates or corrections that we're already aware of. Just keeping in mind that we do have a number of these technical updates uh, documented um, and edit editorial corrections documented. We've done some analysis ar around them, some kind of development of what uh, solutions might look like in at least a few areas, but not so, so comprehensively or systematically. Um, again, because we wanted to have this session today and kind of align on the um, overall approach in, in this area. So with that said, in, as part of the transition planning around the ISSB, we want to take a view on how to best transition kind of the known updates or corrections in the direction of the ISSB and what, what that should look like in terms of kind of priority level and how that might fit into um, our ongoing processes and transition plans overall. Um, so point being, we've taken a different approach than what we would have expected 
um, a, a, a little earlier this year. And uh, but with that said, it's still a really important area, a big part of being a standard setter, um, kind of addressing some of these more minor or narrow scope issues and corrections. Will's going to get into this a lot more in the session, and we certainly welcome your feedback on the thinking around the staff recommendation overall, as well as um, you know if, if folks have suggestions or comments around priority level or other aspects to inform our thinking around transition planning, that would certainly be helpful as well. And I hear somebody screaming with excitement in the in the background there. Someone, uh, someone could go on mute. Um, so with that said, that's all the the really the context that I have. Uh, Jeff and uh, board members, and I will now pass it over to Will, who will really lead the session. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. Uh, apologies there. That was uh, some screaming coming from my my brain that uh, somehow made it out uh, through. Uh, actually, just kids in the background here. Uh, so uh, moving forward uh, with this, and really do appreciate that. Oops, diving into this a little bit more. Uh, here, really across the the SASB standards, you know, we see a need there to efficiently clarify and correct some of those minor or narrow scope uh, issues through this defined and transparent process. And so these issues can be identified through staff's monitoring of industry work, as well as things brought forward to the attention of staff by market participants as they're using the standards. And really, in in the years following approval of the standards by the board staff has noted a number of opportunities here to address those issues. And staff believes that it would be inefficient and not timely to apply our current project-based model to address these issues and therefore recommends that we put in place a technical updates process and an editorial corrections process here to address some of those necessary updates in the future. And to briefly explain a little bit here what we mean by a technical update and an editorial correction, which we'll define a little bit uh, in more detail here later on uh, in the session uh, with some specific examples as well from the standards. But a technical update can be broadly thought of here as a minor or narrow scope issue that clarifies the, the wording in the standards while maintaining those current principles. And an editorial correction uh, somewhat differently there can be you know broadly thought of more as a correction of uh, minor inaccuracy in the standard here something like a spelling error grammatical correction that doesn't change the meaning of the text and what I want to do now is uh, take a look at how these processes could actually fit within our due process and so as you see on this slide here, this visualization of it, we can think about our standard setting in terms of two main areas as they're related to due process. And those tools that help to update the standards, those standard setting projects that we currently have in place here with this possibility of, of developing a, this technical updates process within that due process for those narrow scope issues and, that are aggregated uh, in terms of the updates. And then we can also think about the tools that don't update the standards necessarily, but provide that market guidance and those being the bulletins and the other general guidance that uh, we've already developed, uh, which could be supplemented here by that editorial corrections process that will focus on those typos and other grammatical changes to the standards. And so the way that we developed these recommendations was really looking uh, to uh, financial accounting standard setters here, the International Accounting Standards Board and the Financial Accounting Standards Board uh, to really help develop those recommendations and inform our process. And so now I wanna go ahead and dive into a little bit more about what staff's recommendations are for a technical updates process. And so here, I first want to help clarify a little bit more about what we mean by a technical update in some more detail. And for that, we can really look to the IASB, the International Accounting Standards Board and its process, which defines what we're calling a technical update here as something, and just highlighting a few of the main points here that is, uh, again, minor or narrow in scope, something that is widespread and material to those affected now or in the future something that is well-defined. It essentially helps to clarify some wording in the standards, or maybe it replaces unclear wording 
And it does maintain those current principles and does not propose a new principle or change an existing principle and something that can really be resolved in a timely manner. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll go ahead and provide some more examples to really help illustrate how this process could be applied to our work. Uh, but now I want to go ahead and take a look at how we'll, we'll structure the process in terms of a few key areas that staff has identified and share our recommendations on uh, how to, to implement uh, this process around technical updates. And looking to that first area of these process attributes here, staff would recommend that an agenda project be established that would aggregate those multiple updates across the standards. And here the thinking really being that it would help to create that transparent process, initiate due process, it would help to optimize resources to avoid continually adding multiple narrow scope projects and releasing standards updates on a continual basis uh, or as a as needed basis uh, and really be consistent here with what uh, is done at the FASB and the IASB. And then in terms of determining what that technical update is, staff would also recommend here that uh, the IASB's decision-making criteria be looked to uh, which was referred to uh, earlier, just defining what a technical update is. And really uh, the reasoning behind that and the thinking there, these principles um, are, really help to create that space for a healthy debate and, and flexibility in standard setting and really representative of somewhat similar needs looking at some of the uh, examples later on. Uh, also just the global acceptance and understanding the use of the IFRS standards around the world and, and also the similarity to um, to, to the FASB as well to a certain extent. And really making these recommendations on what could be considered for a technical update here, staff is also recommending that the recommendations uh, be made directly to the board by staff, uh, which we wanted to highlight does differ from the IASB's process. And the reasoning behind this and thinking about it is just the simplification of the, the process uh, at this stage since standing up an expert committee to those who are more familiar with the IASB's process to develop those recommendations uh, could just be quite quite a substantial investment and potentially just an inefficient use of, of resources given the current development state of uh, sustainability standards. And now continuing on with those uh, recommendations. Oops. There we go. In terms of, of thinking about some of the, the next major areas here, um, staff would really recommend as well too that uh, the areas identified for a technical update be discussed and approved at a public forum meeting, um, much like what we're doing right now. Um, and so thinking about uh, following that due process here uh, with that board oversight of the updates being made to the standards, that transparency, supporting credibility as a standard setter, and really the, the ultimate goal of improving the quality of updates and, and mitigating any risk of an inappropriate update here um, uh, and thinking about the, the need for board review and public transparency. And further, staff would recommend on the field work to be done there, that it be kept to a, a minimal basis, really, so no outreach or consultation would be explicitly required, but could always be pursued um, if it seems to be advantageous to do so. And that really would help to focus staff's time on those projects uh, that just require more research to solve and develop recommendations there to the board. And so similarly here in line with due process, staff would also recommend that the aggregated technical updates be exposed for pub public comment here before a standards update is issued. Again, ensuring that we continue to follow due process here and have that transparency with an opportunity for, for the public input and supporting credibility here as a standard setter. And again, uh, looking to alignment consistency with what's done at the FASB and the IASB. And then finally, the last point in terms of the recommendations to touch on here is just thinking about the frequency of those updates. And here staff would recommend that a annual process be implemented with a defined timeline and an effective date um, to be considered there. And for an example, uh, the ISB releases their exposure draft in the third quarter of the current year that they're uh, working on their, their updates. And then it issues those updates uh, in the second quarter of the following year after completing that public exposure period, and then the updates do become effective on January 1st of the year after 
that completion. So just to provide a bit of an example of, of how that uh, uh, annual update process is approached by the ISB. And here the thinking being that this would be consistent with that, that uh, international application of it in terms of the use of the IFRS standards around the world and, and looking to that as a related process. Really also too to establish both that internal and external accountability to, to update the standards and maintain the process and really help to manage expectations um, of users and, and using this transparent timeline and just having knowledge of when to expect these updates. And of course, there could always be an opportunity here to uh, address more urgent issues that may be outside the, the uh, annual update cycle. And so next, wanted to get in just a few, uh, provide a few examples here to illustrate how that process could work within the uh, context of the SASB standards. And so looking to this first example of a technical update, this coming from the product sourcing, packaging, and marketing topic in the multi-line and specialty retailer standard, there's an inquiry received uh, by staff on whether revenue here should be counted more than once if a product is certified to more than one sustainability standard, and really a question about how that amount should be calculated. And this uh, would be an example that staff would consider a potentially strong candidate for something like a technical update here, since the focus really seems to be on clarifying the wording of the metric and the technical protocol and really ensuring some consistency here between existing standards. There's a similar metric uh, in the same sector from the buildings, uh, products, and furnishing standard. And the technical protocol there explicitly states that the certified item in this case should only be counted once if it's certified to multiple standards. And so here we also see that the issue appears to be well-defined, narrow in scope, uh, can, may not necessarily be able to be resolved within our current guidance, and could hopefully be resolved in a timely manner without really changing the existing principle of the metric. And so for example here, this issue could potentially be addressed through a wording clarification, uh, looking to align with that other metric, something such as the entity shall disclose its gross revenue from products that are third party certified to an environmental or social sustainability standard and accounted for by the entity only once. And looking to the next example to help highlight this a little bit more in terms of the thinking, this one coming from the oil and gas midstream standard in the ecological impacts topic there, again, uh, inquiry received by staff on a question about a period of time that defines, in this case, uh, a short-term spill from the technical protocol. And staff would similarly consider this to be a strong candidate for a technical update here since the, the issue appears to be really on clarifying the wording of the technical protocol and it's unclear what is intended by a short-term spill. And a definition here could be provided, for example, based on a commonly accepted practice or, or some guidance from the industry, which in this case seems to imply that it could be something less than a two-year period. And so this issue also does appear to be well-defined, uh, narrow in scope here, and, and may not be able to be resolved through our current guidance and hopefully could be resolved in a timely manner without really changing the existing principle of the metric, but providing that clarification on, on the intention there. And looking to a final example here, uh, also from a similar industry, uh, the oil and gas exploration and production industry, and looking at their reserves valuation and capital expenditures topic there, there's a, a question that came in and it appears to first possibly simply be a simple clarification here around the meaning of the, the wording uh, of embedded. Uh, but there also seems to be a broader question that was uh, supplemented in terms of that around the emissions potential and whether or not it could extend to uh, scope three. And so this example provides a little bit more uh, flavor and, and understanding in terms of what may be outside the, the scope of a technical update in terms of thinking about how this uh, inquiry could be relative to our overall climate strategy and approach across the standards. Um, it may not be uh, easily resolved within in a timely manner. And so now having gone through these examples and our recommendations around a technical updates process, wanted to then uh, go ahead and dive into that editorial corrections process uh, that was also mentioned here. And again, first here, wanna help 
uh, illustrate a little bit more about what is meant by an editorial correction. And again, looking to the IASB and its process, really defining uh, what we're calling editorial correction here as uh, explained by them. We're thinking here about something that normally fixes these spelling errors, grammatical mistakes, uh, something where technical staff can make those editorial corrections to the documents uh, where these corrections really do not alter the meaning of the, the text. And again, similarly here, I want to help provide some examples to help illustrate a little bit more about how this could be applied uh, to our work um, as well. And then, but first want to provide some, uh, some recommendations, discuss the, the structure of the process uh, with some of those few key areas that we've identified. And so looking to that first area, that first attribute of this thinking about um, what could be the criteria to define a uh, editorial correction um, here really derived from from the IASB and thinking about how this revises those those spelling errors grammatical corrections outdated links uh, and also again this very much uh, consistent with also what's done at the FASB as well and thinking about this and staff would also recommend here too that the process be established as a separate process from the technical updates process uh, and that the updates here really be made based on need, uh, really allowing for more efficient management given the really extremely narrow scope and simple fixes that they essentially encompass. And again, the consistency there with other accounting standard setters. Uh, staff would also recommend here too that the editor editorial corrections made to the standards also be separately announced to help to provide that transparency to users ensure that there's a documentation there of, of the changes made to the standards and again, consistency with other uh, standard setters. And then lastly here, recommending that these editorial corrections be made by the staff and not require the board's approval, really given their, their nature here as things like spelling errors or grammatical mistakes, outdated links, uh, just since it seems to be not the most productive use of the board's time and expertise really, and um, you know may even delay the process there. And so I want to then go ahead and provide just a few examples here to, to help illustrate a little bit more about what we mean by an editorial correction. And you can see these three examples here and just going through those quite quickly, uh, which hopefully we're able to do with some editorial corrections and thinking about just the, the typo that you see in this first example here. Um, then in the second example, we have a, a punctuation issue where there's a comma instead of a period. Uh, or in the third example there, just the outdated link uh, that could be updated in that example. And so with that, staff would like to then uh, hear the board's views on, on these recommendations um, more generally, just about the overall process. And if the board has any questions or comments uh, around any of the specific components, um, the different elements of the process as well. Thanks, Will. Um, appreciate the, all the work on this and, uh, and, and the overview. What, one question I had just on this uh, editorial corrections is it, to what extent there's um, uh, clarity in what other standard setters do on this or, or what, um, what what's, you know, would be kind of appropriate for SASB standards in terms of thinking about, you know, with an editorial correction, the way we might think about this is that when the board voted to update a standard or to issue a standard, it was with the lens, through the lens of like, you know, assuming everything was correct as we were anticipating, right? And, um, mm -hmm. and so if that's the way we're thinking about it, you know, would, would editorial corrections need uh, a new version of the PDF in a sense, or could we sort of like reissue the, the version that was voted on um, with, with the editorial corrections made, right? Like is, in a sense, like was, mm -hmm. is it a substantive distinction to carry a historical record of, of the, of, you know, the different versions that had corrections or not? I, and, you know, I, I'm just wondering if, if you've had a, a thought on, on that in particular. I mean, I think with technical updates, I would, I would think that the updated version would be important. With editorial corrections, it's sort of less clear to me, and I'm wondering if there's some diversity in practice there. Yeah, thanks for that question, Jeff. Uh, my understanding would be that although there is this separate announcement that is issued to help highlight what those changes are, I do believe that the, the version would um, remain the same, just as the 
since it's not actually um, approved by the board in terms of due process there. So we would still have that same version, although it would be uh, updated, reissued in that sense, um, I, I do believe. Um, but uh, maybe actually uh, Mark uh, might have uh, more thoughts on that. Uh, but I do think, you know, with the technical updates, of course, just because that does go through our um, um, exposure period and uh, public comment that, of course, that that would have that updated um, versioning um, following board approval of of any of those updates made. Um, so I hope that helps to to provide some clarity there. A little bit, yeah. Something maybe to like to think about a little more. Uh, just you know, if we were to to do a, a, you know a, a little more on this project, that would be. I'd, I'd wonder a bit about that. Um, yeah. Mark, did you have a a question or a comment on this? Um, yeah, both, I guess. I think on, on just to follow up on your point, Jeff, on the editorial corrections, I don't have a, I'm not sure I'm 100% right on this, so I will for you to follow up, I guess. On, on, on the FASB side, since it's a codification and not a PDF, my guess is they make the correction in the codification and it's live. Um, I don't know what the IASB does, whether they reissue or, or, or not um, in terms of you know their 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 finalized standards, so it's a good point. I guess the other well before my question, I guess you know uh, my general comments are I think it was, it's it's a great job you did um, pulling together all this information um, from lots of different sources. I'm generally in favor of of sort of having processes like these um, for exactly the reasons you laid out in terms of just the transparency and the understanding of expectations of of how these things get handled. I do think there's a difference between editorial corrections and technical updates, and I do think an annual frequency for the technical updates makes sense with due process um, so that what we think is a minor technical update, we don't end up being wrong about that. Um, you aggregate them so it's not a matter of you know just doing little onesies and twosies and, and and having those out in the system so you know once a year for people to expect that kind of thing i think makes sense on uh, uh, maybe you said this and maybe i just missed it and if so i apologize but was there a, a a frequency associated with the editorial corrections um are those just as as they come in or as, as they're noticed or or is that also batched as well yeah so with that the idea would be kind of more as the, the as needed as they're found uh you know hopefully through our proofreading processes and uh whatnot that that we do capture most of of those before they are um you know put out in the standards but uh, really i think the idea there would be to to correct those as we identify them um for the most part you know we could explore possibilities to to think about depending on resource constraints um, combining with that the technical updates um, but currently the the thinking there is to, to approach that on a, on an as needed basis with the assumption that most of those things should hopefully be caught before they're they're issued yeah I agree hopefully they would uh, I guess my only other follow-up point then on that would be I noticed you said you would have a separate announcement every time you made an editorial correction and and I might suggest considering batching those um, mm -hmm. so that there's not little you know, announcements coming out all the time about these little um, editorial corrections for a lot of reasons. I don't think we'd want that. So, but otherwise, I mean, great processes. I think those make a ton of sense to to be considering. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it, Mark. And, and definitely an area where we've we've explored the thinking a little bit, and I think we can continue to to try and understand, uh, you know, with our own uh, processes as well, uh, what what is the most efficient use of everyone's time with regards to the thinking about those those updates and the batches there. Thanks, Mark. Looks like uh, we've triggered a few um, few comments from the board. So Verity, Dan got beat out again. Sorry, right, Dan. Uh, so I I um, wanted to make a comment on the technical update examples and. Just to say, um, and, and referring to your your commentary about the difference of a sustainability standard setting board compared to a financial accounting standards board, and and why the processes might differ for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I look at these three examples, and I personally have to do a little bit of mental gymnastics to find out why there was a question generated, and that just tells me that you know language matters, and there's something that's clear as a bell to to one person is is um, fraught with confusion to another person. And I, I guess I, I wanna say um, some of this seems like just 
you know, language challenge, and, and that's going to be further complicated when you consider more geographies, um, which are already using the standards, but then interpreting them and disclosing to the standards um, language matters, and, and the an order of of adjectives and nouns gets, you know, confusing. So I'm, I'm just thinking of this uh, example about um, short-term spill, how a short-term spill is defined when it seems to me it's about short-term activities to respond to the spill. But, you know, again, clear as Isabel to me. And I'm, I guess I, I wanted to just confirm my working assumption here is that we could come up with a list of these technical updates that we think are worth clarifying. And then instead of having this outside expert group, we could check in with our standards advisory group, which includes a number of subject matter experts and preparers and professionals who are really well versed in, in um, looking for the technical details of disclosure guidance. Um, do you see that as a you know, more practical path in, in lieu of having a, an outside expert group? Exactly, Verity. Uh, I think you exactly hit the mark on that for sure. We we have that resource there. We can capitalize on that. Uh, those industry experts, um, you know, help to uh, essentially kind of can help us serve that role without having to formally set up that that uh, outside expert group. And so very much uh, in line with the, the thinking there and going to those folks that are, you know, in the field and doing this type of work day to day. The, the and, way and I think just about to that, sorry, yeah, just on this is that uh, that the uh, the standard advisory group is a way for the staff to sort of both source and vet the types of things that they would that the staff would propose to the board uh, for technical updates. And I think that that you know that's just a lot. I mean, that, to me, the thing that's fundamentally different about you know sustainability disclosures compared to the financial accounting standards is just that because of the industry component to the work that we do, there's a lot of complexity in the monitoring. And I think that's that's really probably why uh, the a staff led with you know vetting that happens through the advisory groups like the, the, the standards advisory group is probably the best way to to identify uh, and and kind of like sense source what the what the likely good candidates for technical updates would be. Is, Will, is that what you were thinking? I do, yeah. You know, we do have uh, a number of areas that have been identified already, and so you know that can definitely through that vetting and and working with the the standards advisory group, we can go with those known issues as well as, you know, as as we're looking at other potential projects here and discussing areas to to think about too, kind of maybe opportunities to to hone in on some of these areas and and hearing from from those members explain to us where again there could be some more clarification in the standards where things just may not be you know fully fully understood there and then one one last question for you will and then i'll drop yeah. off and let dan have the floor did we learn anything from the recent updates to the two standards um with our with our early december updates there that would um you know confirm the proposed approach for um, the editorial comments, you know, the spelling errors and so on, that did we learn anything about the relative ease of that process or difficulty that informs our approach here? Yeah, I think Lynn may be able to, to best speak to that, Lynn, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, absolutely, Verity. I, I think, um, as Will noted, there are some internal, you know, resourcing we need to think about. And I think one other element to, you know, issuing updates, like to, to Mark's point earlier, too, on is um, right now the standards are also um, used by licensees and how each time we incorporate these updates, how that's, you know, further integrated into systems, you know, both by licensees and or maybe preparers. Um, it will definitely be a question that we need to further investigate. Um, in around these processes. Thanks. Dan, the screen is yours. Thanks. Yeah, we're we're short on time, and I, I just first I want to thank Will for his his work on this. I, I just I think it's essential for any group, any body that writes rules or issues standards to have a process to deal with both what you've characterized as technical updates and editorial corrections. So it's this is really kind of a, a, of a fundamental project for any standard setter. So thank you. Um, 
I don't have any particular comments on on the the framework you you've laid out. It, it it seems correct to me. I also understand why you know looking ahead to the consolidation doesn't make sense for us to go ahead and 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 put the, these steps, this methodology in place. But I, I did want to ask what what mechanism are we going to have in order to pass along to the IWSB the the things that we know need editorial corrections or that are raise issues for technical updates. I and mean, it's kind of painful to me at least to know that we're going to pass these standards along to our successors with the kinds of edit need for the kinds of editorial corrections that you've identified in in the slides. And perhaps it isn't feasible for us to do anything about those in the in the next six months, but they, they, they certainly ought to be preserved and and presented to the new groups that perhaps in the process of their publishing the standards as part of their due process, they can make these corrections. They may also want to address at least some of the technical update issues. It, it also, in, in my mind, kind of raises the issue of how they would deal with something that's way outside the scope of this project, but that's the, the open issues on internationalizing the, the standards. So again, it seems to me there's a sort of a body of knowledge here of, 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 of what I'll call overall adjustments that ought to be made to the standards that, that need to be preserved and, and passed along to the IWSV. I, I double SV, sorry. Well, uh, thank you, Dan, uh, for your kind words. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, and 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 really, you know, I, I'm sure Brian can expand a little bit more on this. But just to to touch on that, this is uh, an area that that staff, of course, actively records these types of inquiries that are received, and those examples were pulled from that documentation um, there as well to ensure that we are recording this and and do understand where. You know these types of of issues and and questions come in from the market and um, maybe Brian you can speak to a little bit more about sort of that preparatory work that may go into to some of the the work there with the ISSB. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, thanks, Will, and for the comments, Dan. Certainly understand the sentiment that you're expressing that there and and share the the sentiment. Um, we're not going to be able to specifically answer the question and kind of the the the, the transfer and the, the transition. That's really what we're getting into more and more details on now and expect to early early next year. So we hope to be able to come back to you with a much more specific answer. But the, I mean, I think the good news is that we do have this clear you know view, really agreement that the SASB standards are the starting point for the ISSB in developing their industry disclosure standards. And with that said, what really has to be Part of that starting point are um, are some of these uh, what we've even discussed earlier in the meeting today. Some of these key milestones or project um, deliverables, kind of interim steps that we've made a lot of progress on. I think the last uh, um, um, agenda item around the apparel project is a great example, um, as well as th this one here. Where, as Will just articulated, we have some known. Um, updates, you know, documented and that um, should be put put into into effect. And so, how to build that into really the SASB standards as the starting point for the ISSB is it's going to be re re really important. Um, just not able to answer the question specifically, and very much look for, looking forward to um, ISB, ISSB board members, um, particularly the the board leadership, being put into place where we can especially get into a lot more details and agreement. Um, around how we hope this will work, and certainly hope that you, Dan, and some other other board members will be part of these discussions, um, even directly with the ISSB on how to best arrange some of this 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 transition. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Th thanks, Brian, and Will on that. Um, uh, I, I think of a little bit about uh, from the perspective of we're facilitating a transition, and the transition has two components. You know, one is the the work that is being done to the work that will be done related to the body of work, which is reflected in the standards. But the other transition is on the operational side, like the use of the standards in the market. And so understanding from the market's perspective, 
the best way to facilitate ongoing use of the standards as they are incorporated into the IWSB's set of standards. We want to make sure that that process is as smooth as possible and, you know, uh, throwing a bunch of updates at the wrong time would not necessarily help the market to make that transition well. Uh, and so just you try to understand both aspects of the transition, I think, are going to be important and, uh, you know, a lot yet to be understood about that, but uh, but something that's uh, definitely uh, at, the, at the forefront of our thinking. Oh, appreciate those comments, uh, Steph. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think you're going to have the last uh, comment question, so so take it away. Um, Will, do you have any sense of the volume of requests or queries that would be, you know, technical updates? Are there five that are awaiting being addressed, or are there 55 or 555? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, we don't, you know, know of everything. Of course, there are issues, but we've done some preliminary analysis work there, um, and you know, we are looking in in areas of maybe upwards of 50 potential opportunities here to explore. Of course, not um, precise or concise, um, fully of of everything that we know out there, but um, definitely, um, you know, talking about a number of issues that that have identified and, and not just one or two here but you know lots of, of potential um, areas to to explore and with the with the board and thinking about you know what qualifies in terms of that criteria um, there great uh, well thanks thanks will for for walking us through anything else that you had on on this particular topic i know we're about at time for for the for the meeting today that was it. Uh, just to you know, kind of recap here, and uh, in terms of of next steps, um, again, following up on on some of those areas we discussed, such as that revision or reversioning that uh, you mentioned, Jeff, in terms of thinking about some of those editorial corrections. I think generally, just kind of uh, again thinking about that overall transition process and trying to understand that um, a bit more as well in terms of our own processes for things like these editorial corrections and, and trying to, to clarify that a little bit more and thinking about our work uh, across teams uh, within the organization as well there too. Uh, and then of course, continuing to, to understand how we continue to inform that process during this uh, transition period. Um, and so with that, we'll go ahead and uh, conclude and, and thanks uh, to the board and, and everyone for, for their thoughts, much appreciated. Thank, thank you. We'll appreciate you walking us through that section. So um, with that, we can go to the the, uh, the concluding remarks slide. So we're um, at the end of our time for today. Um, we don't have a ton of time for a recap, so I'll just mention a few things, which is that we're uh, very excited about the ongoing work that the, the Standards Board has going forward. We've got uh, on our agenda a, a, a meeting scheduled for March 2nd, as well as one tentatively scheduled for later in June, which is when we would anticipate the uh, completion of the of the consolidation process with the IFRS Foundation. Um, so a lot of work yet to be done there, but uh, exciting as the work continues to go forward and we look forward to the ongoing efforts related to two new standard setting projects on human capital, specifically with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as in the marine transportation sector, looking at greenhouse gas emissions there. Uh, and then the ongoing work that we discussed today related to uh, raw materials sourcing uh, in the apparels industry and uh, and then some of the learning that we just talked about with respect to uh, the standards uh, technical updates and, and corrections. So uh, really, really great work today from the from the staff uh, and appreciate all of that and I appreciate the board members being here today as well and, and for their active engagement. Uh, throughout the, the the session today so uh, with that i will note that uh, the the meeting is archived and you can again find uh, the archive on our standard setting website and we will leave you with that and wish everybody uh, well for the rest of their day or evening so thank you <laughs>